Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. And the first item on today's agenda will be the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, everybody. I have a few announcements. First, I want to remind folks about the rest of um, the month of May and our schedule. Um, we have on May 20th, we'll be meeting at our regular time for board meeting at 1 o'clock on Wednesday. Um, to hear the updated hospital budget guidance discussion and a potential vote as a follow-up from today's discussion. And then next Wednesday evening, we have scheduled a primary care advisory group meeting starting at 5 o'clock in the evening. Um, and the dial-in information is located on our press release on our website. I also uh, wanted to announce that the board received the 2021 QHB uh, rates from the insurers, MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield. I direct the public to our website to look at our press release, which is on what's new and also under our rate review uh, section of our website to look for the details on those uh, rate requests. The last uh, item, which you'll hear more about as we uh, hear from our hospital budget team today, is that yesterday we posted the revised hospital budget guidance. That is on our website under public comment. We have a special public comment period that started yesterday and will uh, go through next Tuesday at 10 a.m. So I'd encourage folks to review that revised guidance and provide any public comments on that guidance. And I think that's all I have to report today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next item are the minutes of the 429 and the um, uh, five four meetings. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been uh, moved to approve the minutes of both um, April 29th and May 4th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. At this time, I'm going to call the attendance so we can keep a proper uh, record. Um, those names who do not show up in my category, uh, I'm just going to call off the last four digits of their phone number, and if they could let us know who they are, that would be greatly appreciated. 5001. It's Julia Shaw with the Healthcare Advocate. Thank you, Julia. 6959. Thank you. 8869. Toby Howe, MMR. Thank you, Toby. 0341. Zero three four one. That might be me, Kevin. Steve Gordon in Brattleboro. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I was going to say it's a Brattleboro number. <laughs> yeah. It's a main number. I was looking for my office number. Sorry. <laughs> Glad to have you on board, Steve. 4191. Devin Green, Vaz. Thank you, Devin. 4534. Walter! Thank you, Walter. 9686. That's Sarah from Blue Cross. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, um, 2505. Jennifer Collis, UVM Medical Center. Thank you, Jennifer. 6376. Mort Wasserman. Thank you, Mort. 7438. Ham Davis. Thank you, Ham. 3082. Carmen Austin, UVM Health Network. Thank you. 8461. John Olson, Department of Health. 
Thank you, John. 1042. I think that's me, Robin Alvis, NMC. Thank you, Robin. 9,000. This is Nancy Hogue with Diva. Thank you, Nancy. 8629. Hi, this is Lisa Herto with Diva. Thank you, Lisa. 7520. Bob Hersey from NVRH. Thank you, Bob. Welcome. 7111. Judy Fox from Rutland. Thank you, Judy. 6335. 6335. This is Andre from Brown. Thank you. Three, two, one, two. Hi, that's uh, it's Kathy Mahoney from the advisory committee. Thank you, Kathy. Seven six three two. Jeff Teeman with the Hospital Association. Thank you, Jeff. One two three two. Dana Way Heath CVMC. Thank you. Eight 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 eight. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. I think that's the Morris. That might be a Copley number, Kevin. Just I, it's a unique oh. number. So. Yeah, I apologize, and that would be me, Kevin. Uh, Jeff Hebert with Copley. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, it's such Jeff. a unique number. Yeah. Nine eight zero six. Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Thank you, Mike. Forty-eight twenty-four. Forty Area code 916. Uh, yeah, that's me, Kevin. It's Eric Schultes from the HA. I'm sorry. I forgot my phone number all of a sudden. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. <laughs> we know you were trying to be anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm also seeing uh, Susan Aronoff and Lucy Guerin calling in. Um, Orca. Mark Stanislaus, Carol Stone, uh, Wayne Bennett, and I believe Abigail, everyone else's name you'll have under the presentation list. Did I miss anyone? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Kevin, this is Susan Gritkowski, MVP. I'm on 5058. Thank you. Yes, and this Do you is want me to? from Northwestern 8887. Okay. And who was it that said, Do you want me to? It, I wasn't sure. I just called in. You were reeling off the numbers. This is Dale Hackett, and I'm 7936335. Thank you very much, Dale. Glad that, glad that you could make it. Anyone else? Uh, this is Joe Wynn from Copley here. Hi, Joe. How are you doing? Great. Kevin, Dan, Dan, from Gifford. Hi, Dan. Sean Tester from NVRH. Thank you, Sean. Mark Hage from Vermont NEA. Thank you, Mark. 
Well, we have a good size meeting today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over um, to Sarah Kensler to um, introduce our first presenter. Sarah? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Michael Baylett of Baylett Health um, to today's meeting. We've invited Michael here today to continue our conversation about affordability and sustainability. Um, he'll be discussing strategies being used by states across the country to tackle these issues. While COVID-19 has presented our healthcare system with yet another layer of challenges, system level affordability continues to be of great concern and sustainability, already a challenge for rural healthcare systems and others, has only been elevated as a necessary focal point of state healthcare policy. Uh, Michael should be a familiar name to those of us who work in Vermont healthcare policy and also to many across the country. Uh, he has worked with GNCB and a number of other Vermont state agencies, including DFR, Bishka, and DIVA, since 1997 on issues including health insurance regulation, healthcare delivery transformation, and early all pair model implementation, as well as establishing the ACO oversight program. Um, he's worked with more than 40 states in total, including currently Minnesota, Oregon, and Rhode Island. His team's work focuses on healthcare policy with a particular aim of helping their clients improve cost and quality. And prior to establishing Bayless Health, Michael served as the Assistant Commissioner for Benefit Plans in the Massachusetts Division of Medical Assistance, the state Medicaid agency. So please join me in uh, welcoming Michael Bayless, and thank you very much. Welcome, Michael. Good afternoon. Uh, and uh, hello, members of the board. It's nice to be with you today. Um, I am uh, I'm going to, as Sarah said, um, cover uh, what I'm seeing as trends in state affordability and sustainability strategies and pulling out um, those that I think are most notable and may be of interest to you. Um, as I proceed, um, I'll identify which slide I'm on for those of you who are unable to follow online. Um, and I also invite any clarifying questions that members of the board may have as I proceed. Um, this is a little bit of information about um, our firm and our history in Vermont, but I think Sarah covered it. So uh, I'm going to uh, go on and begin the presentation. So um, I'm gonna start by talking about um, definitions of affordability and sustainability because I think it's helpful to have some understanding of what we mean by these terms when we use them. And then I'm going to give you a sample of strategies in use by other states to address either affordability or sustainability or both. Um, and I, I will say that, um, that the focus of state efforts um, pre-COVID-19 really uh, was more on affordability than sustainability, but uh, COVID-19 is certainly um, uh, changing that dynamic and perhaps balancing it a little bit. Uh, and then I'll share both as I go along and at the end some considerations for you to contemplate for Vermont. So let me begin was with what does um, affordable mean? Um, there are, uh, I think, three different perspectives. Um, the first one is the economist perspective that looks at healthcare spending relative to uh, resources that, um, that uh, consumers or the general population has. And the second approach is the, the purchaser view. Um, and this is really um, looking at spendings uh, in the public sector uh, based on the percentage of tax expenditures that are going to spending um, or from a public or private employer perspective um, as a labor cost. And then finally, there's the consumer perspective. Um, and the consumer perspective of affordability is really, um, does healthcare costs impede um, access to and use of services? They are um, distinct views. I would say that um, in my experience, the view that is commonly adopted in states is the economist view. And I'm going to share with you a few examples on the next few slides of, um, of uh, economists' uh, perspectives on affordability. So um, this, is, this is one example looking at healthcare expenditures in relation to income. This is from a, a journal of the Medical, American Medical Association 
uh, paper from a few years ago, and the data are a little variable, but you can see that this uh, fairly simple index um, details a doubling of um, the percentage of income consumed by healthcare costs in this analysis. Um, another way to look at affordability is looking at what's happening um, in terms of uh, real wages and real fringe benefits. So this is a way of looking at wages 2014 um, into uh, the end of 2019 and shows that, that really for a recent um, period of um, the end of 2016 to the third quarter of 2019, um, real wages, that is, adjusted for inflation, were pretty flat um, in the United States. But um, when we look at fringe benefits, um, in fact, the, the real value of fringe benefits, and of course, most of fringe benefits is healthcare spending, um, uh, that real fringe benefits actually declined. Um, and so when you look at total compensation for Americans, and this data comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, there's actually a decline in total compensation between uh, December of 2016 and September of 2019. Um, and one of the reasons that um, the real value of fringe benefits declined is that um, there's been a significant buy-down by employers in terms of the value of health care benefits. And by that, I mean uh, the benefits have become actuarially less rich um, as deductibles and coinsurance have increased. And then um, a last view of affordability. Whoops. Um, oh, I seem to have lost slide. Uh, so, so anyhow, those are a few perspectives on um, on affordability uh, using an economist view. Now, um, politically, um, healthcare costs um, have been a, a real big deal um, across the country for governors. Uh, you can see that in the 2020 state of the state addresses, um, half of the addresses included governors talking about health care costs. So um, affordability has been a, a top of mind issue. And of course, you know, again, our world is completely different um, now since January. Uh, but with our nation um, entering into a pretty severe recession, um, Health care costs are unlikely to be less of a concern, I would say, going forward. So let me talk a little bit about um, sustainability, and specific, specifically financial sustainability. Um, this has been an issue in Vermont that precedes the last few months, especially um, a concern for rural hospitals. But COVID-19 has intensified interest in sustainability, um, not just in Vermont, but across the country, because service utilization has dramatically plunged, um, creating um, sudden and dramatic fiscal hardship for healthcare providers, especially those um, that have little funds reserves and were already vulnerable financially before COVID-19. Um, so I, I think going forward, states will be faced with the struggle of trying to um, ensure both affordable health care spending with reduced tax revenues um, and a recession um, and um, and having uh, sustainability so that our health care delivery infrastructure uh, doesn't crumble due to the pandemic. Uh, another thing I'll note is COVID-19 has really um, made clear one of the harmful effects of fee-for-service payment and one that frankly you know, hadn't been all that evident um, amidst all the other ills associated with fee-for-service payment. Um, and that is, um, if you don't, um, if you don't deliver widgets of um, service volume, then you don't get paid. Um, and and that, that's a dynamic that affects all businesses. Uh, but um, I think we would probably all agree that our healthcare delivery system infrastructure um, need to be treated a little bit differently than some other um, businesses. Um, and we certainly want to make sure that our method of making payment for healthcare services doesn't cause us to lose that infrastructure. 
So I'd like to review some state strategies. I've organized them uh, into these four categories, payment-based um, approaches, cost growth targets, um, public option, and then um, a couple of other strategies that I put into other and, and which I'm not highlighting um, for today's presentation, but we'll uh, briefly make note of. So I'm going to start with uh, payment-based models. Um, and I'm going to start first with um, growth caps or growth targets. Um, I'm sorry, with growth caps. Uh, so um, the principal example here is from the state of Rhode Island. Um, in 2010, their Office of the Health Insurance Commissioner, so they have a, a separate office just for health insurance regulation, which is separate from other insurance regulation. Um, this office established a set of affordability standards um, for oversight of um, health insurers. Uh, and the commissioner uses her rate review process to assess whether insurers are in fact taking steps not only to submit acceptable rates, but actually to increase affordability of health insurance for Rhode Islanders, uh, and then may conduct other activities such as market conduct exams to ensure compliance. So there have been a host of actions that Rhode Island's taken through its affordability standards, which I'll note um, in the next month or so are about to be updated for the third time uh, since the initial release in 2010. Uh, but I want to highlight uh, number one, which is an annual price inflation cap on commercial insurer hospital rates, um, and also a cap on growth in um, total cost of care ACO budgets. Uh, these, uh, these caps are placed on insurers, not on hospitals uh, and not on ACOs. They are on insurers and limit the amount that insurers can increase their rates or their ACO budgets. Um, I'll also um, address a little that later on um, a new primary care perspective payment requirement that's going in uh, this year. So as you can see, there are some other requirements that have fallen under the affordability standards, but I want to focus on the price inflation caps. Uh, the uh, 2019 price caps for Rhode Island were um, CPIU plus 1%. So CPIU is inflation um, that removes um, certain highly dynamic um, elements of inflation, such as energy. So, for example, CPI in the United States just plunged in the last month because of what happened in the oil market. So CPIU removes um, food and energy because those are highly uh, dynamic factors, uh, and this results in a more stable calculation of inflation. So for Rhode Island, it's CPIU plus 1%. And for the ACO budgets, it's CPIU plus 1.5%. Uh, there was a study published in Health Affairs a little over a year ago that looked at healthcare spending growth in Rhode Island. This is in the commercial insurance market compared to um, other New England states. And uh, as you can see here, um, it does appear that the implementation of the affordability standards resulted in Rhode Island's cost growth, which prior to the affordability standards was growing faster than the other New England states, um, to grow at a slower pace. And in fact, for the most recent year, for that gap to be as, as wide as it had ever been. The authors of this paper um, attributed this um, positive impact for healthcare spending growth in Rhode Island to the um, hospital growth cap. So the second concept I want to share is that of uh, global budgets. And the, the model state for global budgets, um, and here I, I mean hospital global budgets, is Maryland. Maryland implemented hospital budgets in 2014, um, and um, they were implemented on an all-payer basis. This was facilitated by the fact that Maryland already had an, an all-payer hospital rate model, uh, so it made moving to this global budget a little bit easier, uh, and, uh, and hospitals are limited um, 
uh, to a budget, but they are also protected by having a budget that gives them certainty of revenue. Uh, and the state employs simple levers um, to make sure the hospital comes in at its budget. Uh, so for example, if volume um, is higher than budget, then the state will reduce rates um, to offset the rise in volume and vice versa. So uh, these budgets are set using historical data um, and the budgets can be inflation each year for uh, a number of factors as you see listed here. Uh, I'll also note parenthetically that uh, Pennsylvania also implemented this model more recently with a group of rural hospitals in western Pennsylvania, but I am not going to describe the Pennsylvania model today. Um, RTI International performed a formal evaluation which they published this past fall, um, and they found that uh, Maryland's model um, in its initial years um, did reduce spending for Medicare for overall spending and for hospital spending, uh, but only hospital spending for commercial plan members. Um, most of the reductions were for outpatient hospital services, uh, and they did this without shifting costs to other parts of the healthcare system. Um, and importantly, um, hospitals were able to operate under the global budget without having their financial status um, adversely impacted. Uh, hospital global budgets are attractive from um, both um, an affordability and a sustainability perspective, uh, perspective especially if they involve prospective payments uh, because they disentangle volume and payment. And in fact, um, One Care does this um, already with its hospitals by paying a fixed prospective monthly payment. So I just want to acknowledge that um, not to a, a, the full extent uh, as in Maryland, uh, but uh, Vermont does have to some degree um, a hospital global budget that includes some prospective payment, just not um, on an all-payer basis as is the case in Maryland today. So the this is an example of a strategy that supports both sustainability and affordability. The sustainability because there's um, there's guaranteed cash flow um, and revenue certainty to the hospital. And from an affordability perspective, because there's some um, uh, theoretical control over the extent to which um, the budget grows over time. The third model I want to talk about is prospective payment. Of course, I just touched upon this um, briefly. Prospective payment is getting a lot of discussion because of COVID-19 and because of the cash flow crises that so many providers have had. And you can see a couple of recent blog posts on this topic. Uh, and again, prospective payment can address both affordability and sustainability, um, unlike um, some other strategies that are good at one or the other. Uh, historically, there have not been, um, there's not been a lot of activity among states to advance prospective payment. As I noted a little bit earlier, the new update to Rhode Island's affordability standards is going to do so, but only for primary care. Um, I'm uh, forecasting state activity in, in this area. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see a lot in the next six months, um, if only to help uh, sustain healthcare providers through COVID-19, uh, which um, unfortunately isn't going away very quickly uh, and is going to continue to uh, challenge healthcare providers. Uh, and uh, again, I, I noted earlier what One Care has done with some hospitals. Um, but they've also had a pilot with some primary care practices with prospective payment. The, uh, the fourth um, option that falls underneath payment models is rate setting. So rate setting is probably self-evident, but this is all payers using one price for a medical procedure. Um, there are big um, administrative efficiencies gained um, through having a um, all payer approach um, if this is implemented in a state, it's certainly going to mean that Medicaid and Medicare prices are going to rise and commercial um, prices are going to drop. Uh, there's um, actually a long history of this model being used in the United States, um, typically, though, just for hospital services. 
about a dozen states did this in the 70s and 80s, and uh, New Jersey's was the forerunner to the uh, Medicare PPS system. Um, but um, states largely abandoned this in the 1980s with the rise of HMOs, um, Maryland uh, being the exception. So uh, Maryland implemented um, this in 1976 when their hospital admission cost was significantly above the national average. And um, in less than 20 years, they were notably below the U.S. average. Uh, but something else happened in Maryland. Um, their admission volume grew and their outpatient volume grew um, significantly higher than elsewhere. This is the, uh, the old squeezing the balloon problem. Um, and so overall, um, while their admission costs dropped, um, their spending wasn't uh, reduced in parallel because of growth in volume. <clears throat> and this is why Maryland moved to global budgets. Um, so a few takeaways um, on payment models. Uh, first, Rhode Island, um, they use their regulations to create a policy lever to apply with commercial insurers. They've applied, they've applied price controls on, uh, through hospital rate caps and ACO budgets um, on contracts with commercial insurers. And of course, they focus on commercial insurers because that's the part of the market where traditionally there's been the least um, uh, control. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid um, have great uh, purchasing and regulatory power that has not existed in the commercial market. And, um, and given that uh, commercial uh, markets um, are governed um, not just in, Rhode, in uh, Rhode Island or in Vermont, but across the country with, um, with non-competitive um, dynamics in the delivery system, uh, it's uh, been effective and important in Rhode Island, at least, to be able to constrain what would have been higher rate increases, if not for the state uh, applying this lever. Uh, and, of course, they've uh, promoted increased spending on primary care and now prospective payment for primary care. Um, prospective payment, including uh, global budgets, um, offer predictable revenue and budget control. Um, and I want to note that prospective payment can be applied in a non-global payment environment. Um, this is not limited just to global payment to hospitals or to primary care. There are many potential applications of prospective payment, including for specialty providers. And then finally, all payer rate setting um, does hold payers all to a single price. Um, experience, though, has shown that it leads to increased utilization. And there's also a very high risk of regulatory capture. And most evaluations of what happened with state all-payer rate systems in the 70s and 80s concluded that this is exactly what happened, that there was regulatory capture. In fact, uh, there is some concern that, that there's regulatory capture in Maryland today. In terms of opportunities for Vermont, um, I think movement towards adoption of prospective payment would certainly support both sustainability and affordability. Uh, and again, there is some of this already happening, but there's opportunity for more of it. Um, and, um, and while um, commercial uh, medical trend in Vermont has been significantly below national rates, I looked at some calculations and uh, for Blue Cross's filings for the last um, half dozen years, the, the medical trend has been about 4.5%, whereas nationally it was 6.1%. So uh, Vermont's done better, uh, but, um, but certainly you could have um, greater control um, and perhaps even further reduced um, growth if you invoked uh, provider rate uh, regulatory authority along the lines of what Rhode Island has done. So this isn't setting, it's simply controlling uh, the rate at which they grow. Okay, I'd like to turn now to cost growth targets. So this is an area of great um, current activity across the country. Uh, and uh, I want to give you both its origins and let you know what a bunch of states are doing. So this began in 2012 and legislation passed in Massachusetts. And the goal was to control um, state health care spending. Uh, and so the state set a cost growth target. And you might think, hey, we've got that already in Vermont with the all-payer um, ACO model. 
but this is a different type of cost growth target. Um, there, um, there was no negotiated agreement with the federal government. Um, um, this is simply setting um, a public um, objective, being very, very transparent about it, and, uh, and pushing accountability using what I would say are soft levers. So uh, for the initial years, they set it at the state's potential gross state product. This is a forecast of, of uh, economic growth um, looking five plus years out, and that was 3.6%. Maybe in 2018, um, the state dropped it to 3.1%. Um, and in 2023, it will default to 36 unless the uh, state's Health Policy Commission sets it at something else, which I'm guessing it will do. Um, cost growth here is defined as per capita change in total health care spending from public and private sources. Um, it's... Um, it's all um, healthcare spending for both claims and non-claims based payments. It's patient cost sharing, deductibles, copay, coinsurance, and it's what's called the net cost of private health insurance, uh, which is really um, insurer administrative cost and um, any margin. So that's, that's the all in definition. In Massachusetts, if an organization exceeds the target, it may be required to submit a performance improvement plan uh, and it can be fined if it doesn't submit and implement um, a plan. So it's a pretty soft lever, and I will admit that when this law passed, I was skeptical about its impact. Um, if the benchmark strategy or, or target strategy doesn't work, then the state's Health Policy Commission can go back to the legislature and say, we need more authority. Um, they have not done that yet uh, for reasons I will now show you. So this is performance against the cost growth target uh, in Massachusetts through 2018. Um, the orange dotted line is the benchmark. You can see it dropped down to 3.1% for their most recent period. Uh, and on average, over all those years, uh, Massachusetts has come in below its cost. There were a couple of years it was exceeded. One year was the year that Savaldi came out. Another year was the year uh, the um, healthcare marketplace collapsed in Massachusetts, and they had all sorts of problems. But, uh, but by and large, uh, spending has come in um, at the total state level. This is not specific to uh, Medicare, Medicaid, or uh, the commercial markets, but the total state level it has come in um, at uh, actually has come in below um, the target for um, these years. Uh, here are a few perspectives. Um, these are from some studies that were done actually a few years ago when the target was still at 3.6%. Um, what I want to call out, and what's interesting is that the second, uh, the first and second comments here really speak to the fact that um, once the target was set, uh, insurers and providers began negotiating their contracts around the target. Um, and this, uh, the target lent itself particularly well for um, ACO total cost of care contracts where there was a per capita budget already in place. So it was easy to translate the target into contracting. Um, but there's a but, and the but here is that uh, despite overall costs being lower, commercial premiums and out-of-pocket costs have grown above the cost growth target. Um, and so additional levers are going to have to be used here. At, and and these aren't so easy problems to solve. The out-of-pocket cost problem, for example, um, is heavily influenced by the decisions that employers make on benefit design. And of course, um, a lot of health insurance coverage is self-funded uh, and hence not subject to state regulation in any form. Uh, there are a number of other states uh, that in just the last couple of years have uh, try to, in different ways, replicate the cost growth target strategy. And uh, you can see um, three states here. Uh, they've taken different approaches. Delaware um, used prospective uh, gross state product uh, as well, but they create the glide path to get down to 3%. Um, Rhode Island uh, set theirs at 3.2% uh, 3 flat um, for uh, 2019 through 2022. Um, and Oregon also is taking a stepped approach, um, starting at 3.4% and going to 3%. Um, in addition, uh, 
uh, Washington just passed a law to create um, a cost growth target. Um, the Governor Lamont in Connecticut um, issued an executive order, and they are currently working on one, and Colorado and California have, uh, have draft legislation uh, to pursue this strategy. Um, none of these states are doing this exactly the same way, but it's the same general concept. Um, but it's a little, this strategy is a little bit more than just a target, especially in Rhode Island and Oregon thus far. Um, they are developing complementary strategies that involve um, a lot of uh, public transparency. So in Massachusetts, there's transparency on how the state is doing and how um, insurers and large providers are doing against the target. But Rhode Island and Oregon are going beyond that they um, are taking steps to develop and issue public reports that identify um, the performance of not just insurers and large providers, but also the cost and cost growth drivers that are influencing growth in spending and variation in spending at the state level, the market level, the insurer level, and the large provider level. Um, and in addition, um, Rhode Island and Oregon, they, although they have not done this yet, are planning on facilitating collaborative multi-stakeholder work to address the cost growth drivers that are um, impacting their ability to come in below their cost growth target. So this is a very important, in my mind, adjunct to setting the target and, uh, and reporting on performance. Um, in, uh, in Rhode Island, in particular, they're leveraging their all-payer claims database to do this. So um, they've had a, a committee of providers, payers, and consumers that have been talking about what types of analyses should be run uh, with the hope that um, ultimately they're going to have standard reports online um, that um, will be generated out of their APCD. Um, and then in addition, they'll have ad hoc analyses um, to supplement the standard reports. I want to give you a few examples of um, types of analyses that different states have created uh, to look at drivers of healthcare spending growth. And these are limited examples. There are many, many more, and some that are much more focused. Uh, this is a report that uh, comes from the state of Minnesota, and it looks at the impact of price, service mix, and volume for five major categories of services. Now, this can be done um, at the market level, at the insurer level, at the provider level. Um, you're just seeing um, an all-state analysis here. And, of course, you can do drill downs in any of these categories, too. So you could figure out, hmm, prescription drugs, it's all about price. Which prescription drugs? Um, or um, inpatient hospital acute services. There's something going on in service mix there. Which services? Which hospitals? Um, this is um, a very high level um, total state, total spending view. Second example comes from Oregon. Um, and this um, too is looking at total spending, not for the state, just for metropolitan in Portland. Uh, and, uh, and simplifies the, uh, the breakdown of spending by comparing price and utilization to a national median rate. Uh, and, uh, and clearly for Portland, um, uh, utilization looks pretty good, but price doesn't. And then the last example is from Colorado. This, too, um, breaks down drivers of cost, uh, but um, is doing it by region. Uh, and so um, here you can see um, regional definitions, usually around um, metropolitan areas in the state. Um, and so you'll see what's the um, the PM, PN, the per capita cost, um, and then um, what's the variation from the statewide median for those regions. So this is this is um, very high level, and again, you could do all types of drill down analysis. But the idea in um, Oregon and Rhode Island is to supplement their cost growth target with lots of transparency on. Uh, cost growth drivers and on variation within the state. So, um, in summary, cost growth targets are a mechanism to slow the growth of healthcare spending. Um, 
It's a little bit like what Vermont has, but it's, as you've seen, it's not the same thing. Um, it sets a budget, it pr promotes alignment around a common goal and utilizes lots of transparency through public reporting. Um, and it can be combined with the data, what we call the data use strategy, uh, to identify cost drivers and um, hone in on interventions uh, through collaborative action. For Vermont, um, it seems that there might be an opportunity to use more of a public data use strategy that does um, uh, drill into um, cost growth drivers and cost variation and make that um, uh, available and then to uh, complement it with collaborative work for which there's already an infrastructure in the state to do that work. Um, and then to develop measures of cost accountability at the provider level beyond total cost of care. So this is something that Oregon in particular is looking at. Oregon is not content just to look at total cost of care um, uh, um, cost drivers, but they actually want to look at price and utilization um, across the state um, at multiple provider levels, including pharmacy. Uh, there might be an opportunity to do this in Vermont for um, specialists and perhaps for other services. Okay, um, uh, topic three uh, is public options. So um, this, uh, this is a topic that got a lot of attention in uh, 2019. And there was quite a bit of state legislative activity in 2019 and early 2020. I think uh, COVID-19 uh, and its impact on state government and frankly on legislative sessions uh, has tempered this. Uh, but that, this is an idea that was much talked about when the ACA was being developed, as you probably all recall. Um, it's a state organized plan that competes with other private health insurance. Um, generally, states have, ta have talked about this, have talked about this not as a state um, operated plan, but rather as a state um, contracted plan. Um, so it's, it's different than uh, than saying, hey, let's take um, DIVA and the Medicaid program and make it into an insurance product. Um, the states that are pursuing this are thinking about contracting with insurers as the public option. Um, this, um, this could be a first step towards a single payer system, but it certainly need not be. So uh, Washington is the leader here. Uh, they passed legislation and the public option plan is supposed to become available next January. Um, what uh, characterizes what Washington's doing, what other states are talking about, is the plan uh, is capping provider reimbursement, um, and usually relative uh, to Medicare in Washington and in other states where it's been talked about. Um, in Washington, they also set some minimum reimbursements, so it's really creating boundaries at the bottom and at the top. But it's the it's the cap at the top that's, that's uh, intended to create the savings and produce a lower cost product. Um, it will be of uh, surprise to no one that these are not, uh, this is not a popular strategy either with uh, insurers or with providers. Um, Colorado had legislation that was being considered until last week. Um, their bill died about a week ago. Um, uh, they concluded that uh, because of, I would say, both opposition, but also because of the impact that COVID-19 was having on the legislative session, that they weren't going to pursue it further. But you can see here again, um, they were proposing to cap um, hospital payments as a means to uh, produce a lower cost commercial, commercial health insurance product. Um, so, um, Public option plans, and there are other states, by the way, that have been talking about them, New Mexico, Connecticut being two. Um, they offer uh, more choices for consumers and, and provide new competition in a market. Um, they are a mechanism to implement price controls without um, actually regulating prices. Uh, it's rather done uh, contractually. Um, and as I've noted, uh, the Washington and Colorado designs really are different than the idea of the state operating an insurance plan, it's really the state contracting uh, for one instead. Um, I, I'm not sure the public option um, is uh, a great uh, or a high priority choice for Vermont. I understand that it was considered in the past. 
several years ago and dropped. But um, the Green Mountain Care Board has um, so many existing regulatory levers that it can apply that it's not clear to me that um, uh, it needs a public option given the authority it has to do other things. And then finally, I, I just want to give note to some other strategies that I'm not delving into. There are additional slides at the end of this presentation that go into these strategies further, but um, I'm not uh, going to discuss them greatly now. Um, one is uh, market stabilization. Um, uh, these are risk pools and other ways to stabilize the commercial market in particular. Uh, and then there are prescription drug policies. And, uh, and Vermont's already done quite a bit in both of these areas. And so for that reason, I'm not going to the slides, but if you'd like to consider them later, you will find there are some strategies that Vermont has not pursued that you certainly could consider. So um, let me uh, stop there and invite uh, questions and comments that you may have. Thank you very much, Michael. We're going to start with board members, and I'm going to go in alphabetical order and call on board members if they have questions. Starting with Jessica Holmes. Myself. Okay, thank you so much. Really helpful uh, presentation. Great to see the landscape in other states as we all grapple with affordability. So one is a quicker question. Um, going back to Rhode Island, I noticed that the hospital growth caps were CPIU plus 1% and the ACO growth caps were CPIU plus 1.5%. So I'm wondering if you have any background or thoughts, justification for why the allowed growth rate would be higher in ACO budgets than in hospitals. Sure. Uh, the, the reason is because there are um, – in, in simple terms, there are two things that drive the ACO's budget, changes in price and changes in utilization. So I'd say that half a percent is an allowance for changes in utilization. Um, is that necessary? Could someone say, no, there should be zero for utilization? You could, but Rhode Island decided to give an additional allowance for changes in utilization. Okay. Okay. And I also uh, note that, of course, the hospital um, cap, is only for hospital costs, whereas the ACO budget cap is for all services, not just hospital services. So there could be growth that happens in services that are not, including price growth, that are subject to service, in services not subject to the hospital cap. Okay, great, okay. thank you. Um, my second question revolves around service line optimization and as we're thinking about sustainability and affordability of healthcare services i'm wondering what your research has uncovered with respect to how states and hospital systems are looking at service lines you know they may be different in a fee-for-service world than they would be in a value-based capitated prospective payment world um, particularly this question is important in a rural state like vermont where we have population declines which therefore means volume declines. And so the fixed costs of mounting the same level of services may become more challenging, um, but we also have the issue of access. So I'm wondering, you know, as we're thinking about financial sustainability of hospitals and improving, uh, you know, quality while reducing costs, how does service line optimization, optimization play into that conversation and what have you seen in other states? So – States used to be a little bit more involved in that type of issue when there was more of a uh, health services planning role within states. But states backed away from that quite a while ago, and by and large, they haven't gone back there. Um, and and I'm, I'm not saying that that's the right strategy, but they pretty much left it to the market to decide who offers what services and who stays in business and, and who, who can't stay in business. Um, and are you, okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that that's right, and, and I also don't know that it's a fit for Vermont, uh, but, but that's what I've seen in other states. Well, are you seeing that – you said you talked about the market. So are you seeing as these payment methodologies change from fee-for-service to fixed payments, capitation, global budgets, are you seeing a natural – change in what services are being offered, more, you know, more affiliations 
sharing of services, things like that that are naturally evolving yeah. as the payment system evolves? And, and what does that look like? Yeah, so that so that happens in big systems, right? So we've had tremendous growth of big systems where big providers gobble up small providers. And once they do that, then the system itself decides we want to rationalize our distribution of resources. So little hospital that we just acquired, you're no longer going to offer that service anymore. You're going to offer these services. Um, but that that that's happening within the, the corporate structure where the bigger entities trying to figure out how to manage its resources. It's not happening at the level of the state where the state's saying we need to rationalize our distribution of resources. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Robin Lunch. Hi, Michael. Thanks for your presentation. It was very clear. Um, and I actually don't have any questions, but it's good to see you. Nice to see you, Robin. <laughs> thank you, Robin. Tom Pelham. Well, like the others, thank you very much for this presentation. There's a, a lot to chew on there. And uh, it's, you know, it's timeliness relative to uh, what we're all experiencing now is, is, uh, is um, appreciated. A couple of questions. You mentioned um, regulatory capture once, and I'm just wondering what your sense was of if you could give more definition to that and relative to the payment models, um, what what payment models are most and least vulnerable to regulatory capture? Okay. So by regulatory capture, I mean that the entity that's setting rates in time um, uh, becomes heavily influenced by those they are regulating, um, such that the, the financial discipline um, of the regulatory structure becomes compromised. Uh, and, um, and, and evaluations of old state rate setting said that that's what happened in a number of states that used to set rates. Um, that it's, it is very, very difficult to maintain independence between the regulator and the regulated providers uh, when the regulator is setting rates. Um, in terms of payment models, I, I, you know, the only experience that we have um, with regulation of rates is for fee-for-service rates. So, would it be the same for other payment models? If, for example, what was being regulated was uh, a PM PM budget, um, I would think that the concept would apply there. But there's actually no evidence of it because there's never been that type of uh, rate regulation. Thank you for that. Uh, my second question would be um, in terms of these payment models and independent providers, which uh, which of the models uh, would you say that are most friendly or well received by independent providers and which less so? Uh, I think this is changing. So um, I think that particularly for entrepreneurial independent providers, fee-for-service payment has been attractive uh, because it provides the opportunity to, um, to innovate and to grow your business and your revenue. Um, I think that experience with COVID-19 um, may lead, and I'm speculating here, I have no data to support this, but it may well lead many um, independent providers to think a little bit of uh, revenue certainty to keep me from going under. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, specialists who've seen 75 plus percent of their volume disappear overnight, that that might be attractive to them. I think we've seen a little bit of that here in Vermont. Um, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Tom. Um, Maureen Yusufer. And Maureen, um, just like the public, I, I saw your text and I see that you were bumped off the internet, but you're participating by phone. And when we go to public comment, what you're going to have to do, Maureen, is hit star six. So, Maureen? Hi, can you hear me? We can. <laughs> I'm trying to sign on. My internet went out on me. 
Um, so I think I heard all the questions. I, I might have missed Jess's at the beginning because I got knocked off. Um, just a question on how do we balance the affordability for the consumers and achieving the sustainability for providers? And, you know, I know you're trying to give some examples on the prospective payments and things like that, but at times it can be at odds. Um, if we're going to make our whole healthcare system sustainable, which is what we want, it has involved increasing uh, costs to the consumers. And so I'm just wondering, you know, how you look at balancing the two of those. Yeah, I mean, you're fair to call it out, Maureen, because they, they are definitely in conflict with one another at times. Um, and I, uh, I'll be honest, there's no easy answer to that. Um, the, I'm, because I, and I'm sure you hear this, where a provider says, if I don't get more money, I can't stay in business, and then you've got, I can't afford my health insurance. Um, that's um, that's a hard problem to solve, um, and um, and it will probably uh, involve some painful decisions. But they are not, they are sometimes not reconcilable, and I think we all have to be honest about that. Okay. And then when we're looking at payment-based um, versus cost growth, um, do you see many states doing both of those options or, you know, the kind of the examples you gave were one or the other, but do you see areas where they're combining, you know, both payment-based versus the cost growth? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, um, for example, um, uh, Rhode Island falls into both categories. Um, they are not uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, and most states are trying multiple strategies at the same time, hopefully having them integrated and reinforcing. Okay. And then just one more, which is, you know, I know one of the models showed, I believe, that on commercial rate increases, were capped or there were, you know, guide, guidelines for what the commercial rate could, could, could go. And how do you see that working with the negotiations then between the providers? Because if they're capped at a certain percent, whatever that might be, let's say 3% or 5%, you know, 5 and they have to manage utilization as well as price in there, um, and they're getting providers coming to them with increases higher than that, you know, how do they manage that? There, you had, I think, one too many days there, so I lost all the parties. Can you? <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't the only one, Michael. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, how do you manage the, if the commercial payer, I believe on one of them, there was just yeah. a cap for the commercial payer. Right. And so the commercial payer then obviously has to deal with the providers and within that has to deal with utilization and um, price increases. So if, if a commercial payer was given a 5% cap that they have to live within, um, then they obviously have to be able to push that back down between pharmaceuticals, everything else. I'm just saying, you know, how does that work? Okay, so the, the cap example was the, um, the state telling the commercial insurer you can't um, – um, do two things. You can't increase your hospital rates by more than X percent. And when you negotiate an ACO contract, the budget can't grow more than Y percent over what it was the prior year. And so that just means that the provider who enters into the agreement, assuming the provider is willing to enter into the agreement, has to say, all right, we're going to find some way to constrain um, our expense growth to stay within that budget. Now, they may actually then be happy that the insurer is limited on how much more they can pay the hospital, especially if they are not a hospital-based ACO. Right. Um, right? Now, I, I know that's not the case, you know, in Vermont, but. Right. Um, okay. That's all. Thank you. It was a very, very helpful presentation. Thank you, Maureen. Michael, um, my questions really uh, center around um, those states where they have put in place the um, minimum reimbursement and the maximum reimbursement um, through, the, through the regulatory process. Um, 
Is there any research that shows what the proper premium is for an academic medical center? And, <laughs> and also, um, I'm curious about how they came with 101% um, for critical access hospitals. What's the theory behind that particular number? Uh, yeah, so there's no theory. There's no science to this. Um, okay. You know, states that states that are setting targets or caps, um, they are spending some time thinking about what makes sense, but there's no empirical answer to what's right. Um, and uh, and I've spent a lot of time talking with um, economists on this, as well as with lots of smart stakeholder groups in multiple states. Um, but there, there's no empirical answer. It's uh, it's consensus and judgment about um, what seems right, and also I will say what seems doable. Because there are some people, for example, who argue, why do you have um, why do you have a positive growth cap if we know that we've got 25% waste in the healthcare system, shouldn't it be negative? Um, so, you know, part of the way that, that people arrive at, at caps or targets is based on uh, what seems um, both um, achievable uh, and what seems um, in some manner methodologically right. Okay. Do you want to touch on the academic medical center question? I, I don't have an answer for you. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Is there a spread in the uh, Medicare rates that uh, these states believe covered that question? I've never heard them discuss it. I mean, the, okay. the truth is the issue of um, what is justifiable variation in provider rates is, a, is really a question that nobody has ever resolved. I, um, I did work several years ago supporting a price variation commission in Massachusetts. And that was essentially the question. Everyone agreed we should pay for justifiable variation, but not for non-justifiable variation. And people could identify what were the factors that might justify variation. For example, um, you want to have um, a, let's say you want to have a burn unit of a hospital in your state that you can access. It's standby capacity. It doesn't get used a lot, but you want to have it there. So that's a, that's a cost you want to pay for. But, but no one's ever gone through the exercise of trying to isolate what are all of the component pieces of justifiable variation and then to see what's left over that shouldn't be paid for. Now, we know that a lot of variation in price, um, and there's lots of research on this, is due to market power. But, but no one's ever been able to uh, break apart the justifiable part and, and build it up to a rate. Okay. So at this point, Michael, we're going to turn it over for public comment and uh, questions. And again, if you are on the phone and not uh, listed as a Skype presenter, if you could hit star six before you speak. So is there any member of the public who wishes to offer comment at this time? Again, star six. Hi, this is Mort Wasserman. I have a question. It might not be a fair one, but I, I thought I'd take a shot. Go ahead, Mort. So, so uh, this was an, a great presentation, and your knowledge of the, what the different states are doing is uh, very impressive. Do you have any knowledge of what other Western industrialized democracies are doing? especially ones where there's a mix of commercial. It's going to be a reasonable growth. But for the consumer, you don't have a growth in wages. One of the questions that I'm always asking myself is, when I get that 3.5% growth, or 3.1, 3.2, what have you seen as the best way to distribute that growth in cost to the that with which is within the economy that can afford it because it's not always going to be the consumer. What fraction of the uh, percentage should the consumer cover? And if you're on the lower end of the income scale, obviously you aren't going to be able to pay that much in 
increase, how do we redistribute this cost that keeps making it unaffordable? What what can you draw from your experience on that? Um, so I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of reactions, although I don't know that I have an answer for you. Um, one is um, you, we look at these rates and people think, hey, it would be great if we constrain cost growth to 3.4 or 3.5 or 3.1 or 3.2. Well, if – um, if wages are not growing or they are growing less than that, then even those low increases are harming affordability. Uh, and uh, I think we always have to keep in mind what's happening in terms of wages and household income, because to the extent that, that health care is growing more than that, then um, essentially consumers are losing every year. Um, losing in terms of a of, uh, portion of their income that they can spend on anything aside from health care. Um, and I know that in our conversations in, in Oregon, uh, all those other states that I listed, we've been, uh, we've been working with them. And in Oregon, there was a small employer who was there um, who, when she heard the group wine agree on 3.4%, said, yeah, but that's, that's more than my employees um, can afford for an annual increase. It's too high. And, and it's why they ultimately came down to 3.0%. Um, and, and, you know, on your, your, your real point, which is um, how are people at the lower end of the weight scale supposed to take a 3% increase um, when they can't? I, don't, I have no good answer for that. Um, and, and I'll note further that um, that 3% or 3.5% is for the state as a whole, um, for small businesses in most states, the rates tend to be higher. Um, so if, if you, and, and Vermont's got tons of small businesses, but if you are working for a small insured um, employer group, then um, whatever the increase is across the state, the odds are it's going to be um, higher for you than for everyone else. And I, I don't have a solution to that problem. But you're right to raise it. Thank, Thank you. you. Other, mem other members of the public? Yes, hi, this is uh, Kathy Mahoney. I, I just have a question. First of all, uh, a comment. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I thought it was uh, very well put together. My question is about um, looking at parallel data or balancing metrics in some of this work. You know, you mentioned one of the earlier examples was uh, Rhode Island showing some some positive change in their in their growth. Um, what does their quality outcomes look like? How does this impact patients, or, or does it? And, and and how do you suggest taking a look at that? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So um, some states that have uh, taken aggressive approaches on affordability have said we simultaneously need to be tracking what's happening on quality. So uh, Delaware, for example, when they established their cost growth target, they also set um, quality targets. And, uh, and Connecticut uh, is going to be doing the same. Um, so I think it's reasonable and appropriate, more than reasonable, it's appropriate um, to be treating um, access, quality, and, um, and health equity um, on par. Um, but I also think um, it's necessary to go even one step further. As provider organizations, and I mean both at the ACO level, but also at the individual hospital or practice level, um, as they assume um, more budgetary responsibility or financial risk, um, there is a risk that um, there will be some providers, probably a very small percentage, but some that will take actions that are financially beneficial to them but that are not beneficial to the interests of their patients. Um, and um, I have a, a physician colleague who recently was with a Health Plan in California, and um, she had a couple of contracted medical groups that committed outright fraud um, uh, to take advantage of a financial model which harmed their patients. So um, I do think it is incumbent upon um, states that as they work on pushing on affordability, that they also develop some um, important um, processes and metrics 
for um, being able to protect against and potentially detect um, undesired adverse consequences. Uh, and I just think that's um, a, a generally responsible thing to do. Great, thank you. Other public comment? And again, if you're on Skype, all you have to do is hit the blue microphone button with the line through it to speak. And if you're on phone, it's star six. Hello, Chair. This is Mark Stanislaus. Hi, Mark. So um, I have a comment, and, um, uh, and, and then, you know, I just have a question as it pertains to the um, – well, to the state of Vermont, um, I want to stress what, what Maureen said is with the balancing of sustainability at the health system perspective and affordability. And um, well, so first of all, Michael, thank you for your presentation. Um, it was very clear and understandable. Um, in fiscal year 2016, just to give you an understanding of, of the hospital landscape, and you might already be aware of this, the hospitals had a margin of a little under 100 million or about 4%. In, in 2018 and 2019, that, well, that went down to 28 million and 21 million, respectively, and, you know, 1%. And, and you know, in 2019, under 1%. And I just think the sustainability of, of well, you know, the hospital system in the state of Vermont, it just can't sustain itself on, you know, sub 1% rates or on a sub 1% margin. So, you know, that kind of gets to what Maureen was saying. So it's obviously a delicate balance. The question as I have for the state of Vermont is that I think that we have some unique circumstances here that we have a very small population. So when you do these modelings over smaller populations, um, there are usually higher variations. Um, we have one of the oldest states um, in the United States, I think we're the second or third oldest state. And as you know, the older people get the more care that they utilize. We have very, very little hospital consolidation across our state because I sense that's the way a lot of these other states are, you know, building efficiencies is, you know, possibly through consolidation. And then, you know, because we just don't have the population here, there are a large amount of specialty services that that our residents need to go outside of our state. So, you know, and when residents go outside of your borders, it's much harder, well, to regulate it. So when you attempt to put the cap on it as a whole, you know, it, it seems the in-state providers are barren with a larger burden of the change. So, we know, I, I was just wondering if you could speak to some of those factors and we know if, say, we know some of them are real or, you know, some of them are not so real based upon your experience. Uh, so, you raise a number of factors. So, um, yeah, it's the, the issue of um, small numbers and small providers um, uh, is certainly a big concern in Vermont. It's not only in Vermont, almost every state um, there, and there are exceptions, almost every state has large rural areas um, and some frontier areas. Um, and so it's not only a Vermont problem, but it certainly is a characteristic Vermont problem. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, you're reiterating Maureen's point about the struggle to balance affordability and sustainability. It's, it's there, and, it, and I think um, I think everyone needs to be honest and direct about the, the trade-offs um, when confronting it. Um, your point about out-of-state providers. Um, so, you know, um, Vermont is not unusual in that it has people going out of state. And when we did work in Delaware, they've got tons of people going to Philadelphia to get health care because Philadelphia is practically on the Delaware state line. Um, I, I think you are right that it's important to think about um, how to make sure that um, that uh, spending and particularly price growth to out-of-state providers um, are um, in some way uh, controlled uh, because uh, not only is there an equity issue for Vermont providers, if that's not the case, but uh, to the extent that there's significant spending going out-of-state, and there is in Vermont, 
um, then you're losing a significant amount of control over spending growth. Okay, other members of the public? Hearing none, again, Michael, we want to thank you. Uh, um, it's a lot of food for thought and uh, a very well done presentation, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to dialogue with you. So at this point, um, board, we're going to switch over to a discussion on this year's hospital budget guidance. And um, when you are ready, Pat Peroni, if you could take it away. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are here, as Kevin noted, to continue our discussion on the hospital budget guidance for fiscal year 2021. And I will do my best to announce these slides as I move through them and any other documents that we plan to review. Um, before we start, I'll just give you a rundown of um, how I intend to proceed. I'm going to start with some uh, little recall of the logic that we used um, as we navigated the last seven weeks or so since we postponed this process. Then I'll move through the, um, the slides as, as is up on the screen for everyone to follow along. And I'll just give a brief overview of the financial templates that we are recommending um, be considered by the board for submission by the hospitals when filing their 2021 budgets. And I can navigate, once we move to discussion with the board, I can navigate the actual um, written guidance document for board members to um, discuss any particular points uh, within that document that they would like to talk about. So with that, <clears throat> I'll begin with the logic. Um, in creating this amended process, um, we built a more skeletal version of the guidance that we feel is flexible and still flexible for the hospitals and still informative for the board. Um, regarding the financial template, um, that, as we will, as you will see, is uh, should be very familiar to the hospitals. It's it's similar um, in many aspects to the financial documents they submit every month to the Green Mountain Care Board, and it should be familiar to the board um, from the staff analysis. Uh, that they receive every year prior to hearings, which is essentially a boiled down version of what the hospitals submit uh, from a financial perspective, a rate perspective, payer mix perspective, et cetera. So we wanted to use a document that um, both sides would understand and can use and is familiar to them. Uh, we also considered the current situation within our hospitals. We know that um, many have had staff reduced and resources um, diverted from um, the normal course of operations to provide the essential care and protection for patients within those organizations. And we wanted to be considerate of the fact that they may not have the human resources at their disposal that they normally would um, when putting together their fiscal year budgets. <clears throat> we considered a few different options around budgets. We looked at the potential for um, micro budgets, breaking it down into three or six months portions, but that did not jive with our attempt to ease the burden on hospitals that are operating with reduced resources and staff. So we, we moved that thought aside. Um, <clears throat> and statutorily, we can't go beyond approving a one-year budget, so we couldn't put forth a two-year option. Um, so here we are looking at a 12-month option Understanding, of course, the grand assumption this year going into these is that all assumptions will be off, most likely, and that's going to be um, very difficult, but yet um, we still wanted to move forward with something that would allow us, as we go through the coming months entering a new fiscal year, would allow us to discuss actively with the hospitals, this was your assumption at budget time, how has it changed according to your actuals, and give us something that we can um, actively discuss and compare and analyze with the uh, leadership of the hospitals. Um, <clears throat> and as we've seen, matters can shift very quickly uh, with COVID being on our in, our in our front yard now. And we wanted to make sure that whatever we put forth in a budget, um, should the hospital get 
for example, halfway through their budgeting process and all of a sudden reports are coming in that they're exceeding their projections or maybe falling short of that they can easily um, make amendments to this prior to submission and still meet the time frame. So it really is about flexibility on their end and still providing the necessary financial information for the board to make an informed decision and engage with the, the hospitals um, during the hearings. So with that, I will begin to move through the slide deck, um, moving from page one, the intro slide, to page two, how did we get here? And some of the background here on March 18th, uh, board meeting, the board waived the 20, uh, March 31st deadline for um, making a decision on budget guidance. And they did not expect fi non-financial reporting on May 1st. Um, they did vote in a 3.5% um, growth ceiling for NPR. Um, the board recognized hospital budget submissions and challenges created from COVID-19 and that these were uncertain and ever-changing times. And the board directed us to recommend guidance option or options. Um, they also requested the Healthcare Advocates Office to similarly streamline their questions going into this process. And shortly after that, the HCA uh, signaled their willingness to do so. Uh, the abbreviated guidance staff recommendations um, was developed through thoughtful and collaborative initiatives with um, the hospitals and discussions with BOS about how best to move forward with this. The submission date, as you will see, has been moved from um, the historical July 1st to July 31st to provide the hospitals with another 30 days um, to submit their budgets, giving them more time. And, and this all goes relates back to their um, the staffing and resource challenges that they have. The abbreviated Excel budget template, which we'll get to, um, will be used for submission this year and later will be entered into adaptive. And that that's a discussion that we'll have with um, the financial leadership as to whether that will be a um, GMCB entering that data or um, if they would like to do it. Um, we've eliminated part one of the non-financial. Uh, we, we have eliminated part one of the non-financial reporting requirement. Uh, normally, those submissions would be um, in or coming in. Unfortunately, I've lost sound. Um, did somebody just mute Patrick? I guess they did. Um, <clears throat> all right, I will back up. Did you lose sound when I was talking about the abbreviated staff recommendations, Kevin? No. So prior to that? After that. Okay. So we've chosen to um, eliminate part one of the normal budget process, which is the non-financial reporting. Uh, normally, that information would be being submitted now or <clears throat> close to now for um, consideration for the board. And as we've uh, essentially postponed for seven weeks, that did not seem uh, an appropriate measure at this time. We're also recommending that we limit the questions um, to those of technical or clarifying nature once we receive the budgets. Um, again, the timeline has been shrunk, and we want to make the best use of that time um, in consolidating the information for the board. We've also added um, a pretty heavy COVID-19 impact um, element to the budget so that they can better inform the board on a case-by-case -case basis, hospital-by-hospital -hospital basis, of how COVID has impacted them and what assumptions they expect um, will carry them into fiscal year 21. On slide four, we we made note of um, an inventory here of some of the items that we've added, delayed, consolidated, or removed from consideration. And these are uh, high level bullet points. So within each one of these, there is a large amount of detail um, that the hospitals are normally <clears throat> expected to submit to the board. So this is um, a very broad overview of the items that we've taken into consideration through this. Uh, of course, as I just stated, the COVID-19 impact, adding that to the timeline and considering that um, throughout the narrative, throughout um, 
the submission process. The non-financial reporting has been removed. Um, the data input adaptive has been removed to a later date. Comparative financial metrics, we removed a good portion of that. There still are some in there, such as days cash on hand, liquidity ratios, et cetera, that will still be uh, extremely important for discussions later on. Um, the NPR and FPP overview and the guidance has been consolidated into one. Um, there will still be specifics that need to be provided on each, but we have combined that. Other operating and non-operating revenue, we've eliminated, eliminated much of the detail we originally had in there, um, but it still, still should be talked about as hospitals will be booking um, COVID-related revenues um, in other operating line items. So that will still be a conversation that needs to be had. We have reduced the capital investment cycle to a couple of questions around um, postponement of capital operations um, considering COVID. Uh, we've pulled out items like the organizational structure, service line assessment questions, risks and opportunities questions, unique patient questions. Um, ACO, <clears throat> we've postponed a reserve and settlement table until fall that we have been working on leading up to this, but that was um, shelved for the moment uh, because of COVID, but that's something that we still want to work with the hospitals on to gather that information and um, engage them as stakeholders and making sure that the information coming back on that uh, is, is useful to our ACO team and is useful towards um, understanding more thoroughly uh, the all-payer model and how, now that we are a few years in, um, those reserves and settlements uh, are working. So that'll be something that everyone should earmark for a later date, but it's not going to be included in this budget process for our recommendation. Uh, we removed some questions around uh, challenges, employee attribution, mental health and social services. Um, the uh, Vermont, the VIHE information has been removed and several of the appendices where there's a lot of reconciling going on between budget to budget and projection to budget has also been removed. There's uh, normally a lot of detail uh, within those appendices that we have pulled out to make the submission more flexible for our hospitals. So a few of the items that we've <clears throat> highlighted for, for discussion is of course the overall abbreviated guidance, um, potential discussion on change and charge in guidance. That will be a, to uh, certainly will be a topic um, moving into the budgeting session later this summer and early fall, including possible amended mid-year change in charge discussions and any other board member specific considerations around that that they might they want to put forth. Uh, the NPR growth target for fiscal year 21 has been left in the guidance document at 3.5. Uh, as I stated earlier, that was voted in by the board already, and <clears throat> the board should consider discussing whether they want to uh, continue with that or alter or remove um, the NPR growth rate for this year, given all of the considerations around um, how the suspension of elective procedures has impacted our hospitals. Um, kind of dovetailing into all of these would be the enforcement policy and what that might look like. Could that be um, molded to uh, the potential mid-year change in charge discussion? Um, and underneath that, reporting and monitoring for all hospitals. Um, it's gonna be a very interesting um, time moving forward here, late 20, late 20 and early 21 and into next year, um, where perhaps the board wants to consider a higher level of monitoring for all hospitals, given the financial situation that COVID has brought upon them. Um, and then review of the timeline. We've altered the timeline and I will toggle over to the actual budget guidance document now to show you, um, to show you the timeline. So what we've done, as I stated earlier, is we've moved the July 1st submission date to July 31st. Following that, the staff will review, analyze, and ask technical and clarifying uh, questions of the hospitals. Uh, for example, glaring mathematical errors to some statement that was previously. Um, You're fading in and out, Patrick. If you could stay close to your mic, it would be helpful. Okay, I am hovering. Um, <clears throat> The week of August 17th and 24th, we've left the hospital budget hearings uh, that have already been scheduled in place. And for August 24th and 26th, the staff would provide their regular preliminary budget overview of the board 
and from September 2nd to 15th, board deliberations, votes to establish budgets in the board meetings. And by the 15th, the board would issue budget decisions. <clears throat> and that all flows through to October 1st, which is our normal date for submitting orders. And that's important because when the orders are submitted, they include the board's directive on matters like changes in charges and for the hospitals to have enough time to negotiate and make changes to their charge masters with their commercial payers. Um, they need to have those orders in place so that they can perform all of that work uh, prior to the effective date of January 1st when those go into play. So we've cut down quite a bit on the front end of the timeline and left some normalcy there with a the schedule moving um, from August into October for date of order delivery. I'm now going to toggle over to the financial document to show what it is we are recommending be the document of submission for budgets. Um, starting off the bat on the uh, second page of that document is the technical questions, and those will be um, built out if they need to be according to what we receive for hospitals. Those are some examples. Here is the income statement. <clears throat> At the top, underneath the Vermont Community Hospital naming recognition, there is a green bar that says GMCB data entry, and to the right of that, hospital data entry. What we are going to do is we are going to populate the actual results submitted by the hospitals for the first and second quarter. And the reason we're doing that is one, to ease the burden on the hospitals, but two, moving forward into the third quarter and the fourth quarter is to show the impact of where COVID occurred. Now, COVID came in about two thirds of the way through the second quarter, but the fact that we have to do this with 14 hospitals, um, we do have to draw more um, general line in the sand. And we can't get so minute into the detail of going after specific months or even um, cutting months in half to show COVID's impact. We do have to draw a line and we've chosen to do that uh, at the end of the second quarter, which is March 31st. And that is understanding that elective surgeries were postponed um, in mid-March. So there will be some bleed there that may not come through um, when the board is looking at this. So that should be considered. Under hospital data entry, we won't have all three months of the third quarter, so we are going to ask the hospitals to populate that quarter's worth of results. They will have information for um, the third month of their third quarter before we will, so it is important that they populate that, and then we will ask them for a fourth quarter projection. So it should show from left to right what the hospital has <clears throat> actually had happen with COVID, without COVID, and then the um, actual third quarter and projected fourth quarter and the overall 20 projection. And then of course, all the way to the right, their 21 budget. Um, with feedback from hospitals, we also added under other operating income, a specific line for COVID stimulus and other grant funding as a result of COVID that the hospitals are receiving. And that's important to break that out um, because there have been several stimulus releases um, <clears throat> and there have been Medicare advances and so on that we feel needs to be broken out here for the board to see and understand um, those monies coming through. Other than that, it is a very high level look at expenses <clears throat> and the margins are still in existence down here. Non-operating revenue is still in play. Moving to the fourth tab is the balance sheet and the balance sheet will probably be more important than ever. Moving into this year, it is the heartbeat of financial health for an organization. And we've added a couple items here where they will fill out their budget, their projection. <clears throat> and we've broken out a couple of items around ACO risk reserves for um, assets and liabilities. And then more specifically, um, COVID related liabilities. Some of these monies are going to have to be paid back and it is important to understand the short-term and long-term effects of the debts that the hospitals are having to incur related to COVID. There could potentially be financing that the hospital seeks and, and attains um, for access to cash. We've seen some of that with lines of credit, et cetera, being expanded or attained. 
Um, and also for the for some of our hospital stakeholders, adding a day's cash on hand line item to show the impact of the COVID monies on days cash on hand. Um, some of the Medicare monies <clears throat> the hospitals are holding on to until they absolutely need to use them um, because they will have to be paid back if matters turn around more quickly. Um, then they hope not to use those those advanced funds. Um, so we're trying to be high level, but also informative for the board to see the impact of some of the financing um, challenges that have come to the hospitals. On page five, we've broken out and we are requesting um, funding sources that have come to the hospitals that will have to be paid back and those that do not have to be paid back. Again, a little more detail for the board members to see what the hospitals have received for COVID related funding or advances. We've added into this that the hospitals wouldn't normally see on their monthly financial submissions, but the board would see in the staff analysis, a tab related to um, justification for change in charge and net patient revenue increase. And this is uh, this should be very familiar to uh, the board members. And we built this out a little bit around the net patient revenue change due to charge request for commercial Medicaid and Medicare with some of our hospital stakeholders to outline that more thoroughly for uh, the board. And on the final slide, slide seven, we've um, compacted our normal um, payer mix chart for the hospitals to complete. There's normally quite a bit more detail built into this from the hospital's perspective, and we've stripped that down as best we can um, to still provide a certain level of information for the board to make uh, their decisions on. So with that, I'm going to toggle back to the uh, slide deck. And the next steps, uh, we've, as Susan mentioned at the start in her executive director's report, public comment was opened yesterday and will remain open until May 19th at 10 a.m. Um, we will need to receive the healthcare advocates questions once they've had a chance to review our recommendation uh, moving forward. We have a possible board vote next week, Wednesday, May 20th. And then um, if we do receive a um, vote of approval from the board, we will distribute to the hospitals and post to our website uh, the budget guidance materials. And with that, I will turn it over to the board. And as I stated before, um, I am ready to uh, navigate through the um, actual guidance document to specific sections um, that you would like to discuss. Thank you, Patrick. Um, you know, in, in a traditional year, um, the board is primarily focused on cost containment, but this is a year where the primary focus has to be on hospital sustainability and trying to get our healthcare system back on firm financial ground. And one of the things that I wanted to uh, start you off with was on enforcement. Um, as I said at a board meeting last month, I'm hopeful that um, we can minimize um, this process for hospitals and also give them the opportunity to build back up their day's cash on hand um, to make them financially solvent. And in that vein, um, I had proposed that uh, there would be no penalties for obviously 2019, um, no penalties for 2020, and that the penal penalties for 21 would be um, basically um, calculated adding both 20 and 21 together to um, come up with um, a cumulative amount. What we know is that um, the hospitals have seen a huge decline in services as they could only deal with emergent and COVID related care. As they ease out of that, there's, there's gonna be some unwillingness from the public to go back in immediately and we don't know what that effects will be. But over time, there will be some pent up demand that um, hospitals are gonna to have to deal with and that pent up demand is gonna be limited in different ways at each hospital because 
what the capacity is at one hospital will be different from another. So the hospital will be limited by um, what their staffing is, um, by what their physical capabilities are as far as procedure rooms and things like that, and they will not be identical. So uh, I didn't notice a change in the guidance when it came to enforcement. Have you considered that, Patrick? Yes, we have. Um, but that was one thing that in discussing with board members, there were several different views on that. And our thought was that we would uh, open that up for a discussion. Um, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, it seems that many people thought that once the doors were back open, they would be able to recoup. But as the longer that this has gone on, the less likely it is that um, they are going to meet their fiscal year 20 numbers and that that will bleed into um, 2021. So they may come in under in 20, over in 21. But there's also talk out there now that they may just flat out lose a certain percentage of that too. Um, so we wanted to see what the board members felt about um, that regulatory lever with enforcement, but also should we get into the change in charge discussion with a mid-year amendment um, that would also be a lever too, um, depending on what's happening with each hospital. So it's a little more open from our perspective. Um, so we really wanted to leave that up to the board to, to find a sweet spot. Okay, so I'm gonna start off in alphabetical order again and call on uh, Dr. Holmes first. Hey. Well, I'm definitely, I'm interested in hearing what some of our my, our colleagues on the board have to say. First of all, Patrick and team, thank you so much. The work here is much appreciated. And in general, I am on board with a streamlined approach this year. Um, obviously there's tons of uncertainty and I am um, cognizant of the staffing shortages at the hospitals due to furloughs and other uh, priorities. So I'm curious to hear, one of the things I'm, I'm curious to hear in the public comments, um, hopefully from hospitals, is on the timing issue of submissions and even the hearings. In my mind, whatever budgets are submitted, I think we want to optimize the data reliability. Of course, we have a lot of uncertainty, but the longer we go on, the more information hospitals will have. So I want to, I don't know what that optimal date is. I said, you know, July 31st is what's been uh, proposed. Um, and we also have to meet the October deadline. So, you know, I want to hear from hospitals on that. So I, I reserve my opinion there. Um, one of the things that I would like to see added, uh, and this is very, very small, but if hospitals in their budget process um, are thinking about changing a service, dropping a service or adding a service, I would like to have somewhere in there where they just describe that. It just can be, hey, we've added this service or we're dropping this service. Here's why. Uh, because I, I look at this as an access issue and we should at least be aware if there are services changing um, to deal with some of the sustainability issues. Uh, I'm not sure, so the 3.5 I'm not comfortable with. Um, so I would like the board to consider doing a vote on that. Um, and I'm going to throw something out there that is, I don't know, a little bit unique, um, which is not to have a cap. Um, I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with one size fits all approaches, but especially this year, it would help us to really understand what hospitals are thinking, what is their best attempt at a realistic budget that addresses their own individual projections on utilization changes due to COVID, that is, you know, what kind of pent up demand are they expecting, um, if at all? And also what is their own path to returning to sustainability? And then we can assess those budgets on an individual basis. So I'm gonna throw that out there. I don't know how others feel about that, but you know, it move us away from uh, this budget to budget world that we live in. And it would actually get us a budget that's based on actuals in a year of a lot of uncertainty. And it would move us away from a one size fits all approach. So throwing those ideas out there but I really want to hear what other people have to say. Okay, I didn't hear a question in there for Patrick, so I'm going to move to Robin Lunge. Sorry, took me a minute to unmute. I don't, 
I don't have a question, but I also did have some uh, ideas. Do you want me to hold that until the discussion, Kevin, or? No, go ahead. Okay, wasn't sure. Um, so uh, one of the areas that I wanted to talk about was um, the idea of having some sort of supplemental uh, change in charge guidance, because it seems like this year we all recognize that the, the NPR targets are, it's going to be very difficult to have any sort of realistic sense of what could be happening there. Um, but I think that we, similar to what we had seen in uh, already this year, I think hospitals are going to, because of the drop in utilization, be looking potentially at change in charge requests as a way to ensure sustainability. And as I mentioned, um, I think it was just last week uh, when we were talking about uh, Northwest request, I think there's a way to look at change in charge as as part of the whole uh, budget in terms of utilization and charge being two ways to get to uh, a budget. Um, and so I, but I think that people are going to be, and myself included, are going to be concerned about baking in changes in charges necessary at a pandemic forever. And so I'm not sure the best way to do this. And so that's one reason why I wanted to raise it and then get other board members thoughts and public comment as well. But I wonder if we should be looking at either some sort of temporary change in charge uh, request um, or some way of revisiting the change in charge mid-year. I don't know what makes the most sense from the perspective of the payer and provider contracts. So I think we would need to hear back from both hospitals and insurers about what's realistic um, in the private world. But when you do look at what Maryland is doing, the way that they've cushioned their hospitals during this time period is they've provided increases in charges to offset the declining utilization. Now, when utilization goes back up, Maryland will reduce the charges to offset that so that they're still hitting a target. So, um, so I wanted to throw out that idea broadly out there for people to think about, because I think um, the other component could be that we need as a board to think about what information we need in order to feel like a change in charge request is justified um, and be a little clearer about what that might be, because I'm not sure that that's not necessarily intuitive uh, to folks. So that was one issue I wanted to raise. Um, I had um, Two other smaller issues. One is that on the CON um, capital questions, um, this is something that I raised to Mike and Lynn to think about, but I just wanted to mention it. Um, so in the certificate of need statute, there are certain requirements about certain types of capital projects being submitted as part of the budget. And also the HRAP standards require that. So I just wanted them to make sure that we think um, either that whatever information we're getting is sufficient to meet those other statutory requirements or that we explicitly make a choice to waive those other statutory requirements, which we have temporary authority to do um, related to COVID. Um, so that's, that's really just a, Stay tuned because I think legal and the hospital budget team have to work that out. Um, the other, my, I would say another idea that I had that um, is a little bit off the usual beaten path for this 
is whether given the volatility and the uncertainty around utilization, uh, should we consider asking the insurers to submit utilization data um, in conjunction with the hospital budget process? That is not something that normally is covered under our hospital budget statute, so it would have to be something that we would do using our COVID-related uh, special authority that we got. Uh, but I think getting information similar to what we got at the meeting uh, last, was that just last week? I think so. Um, could be another uh, piece of information that would be helpful in this context that also isn't reliant on the hospital producing it. So um, I wanted to throw that out as an idea. Um, then in reaction to Kevin and Jess's suggestion, um, I'll just go ahead and react now since I have the floor. Um, I think that um, on the enforcement piece, Kevin, I think it, I, I agree with you, we need to be flexible in terms of enforcement. I kind of like this idea of looking, your idea of looking at it over two years. Um, but I do think if we were to do that, we really, I don't know that we can also go with Jess's no NPR cap um, idea, because then we don't know what we're kind of striving for. And so, um, I'm not, I'm certainly open to more discussion about your suggestion, Jess, about no NPR cap. I think what makes it a little tough is then, um, I mean, maybe there's just no way this year is going to be comparable anyway. And on all of our year over year charts, we're just going to have a big disclaimer. But I think um, there are other ways that I think we can after the fact, back out some of the COVID-related volatility potentially um, or acknowledge it. So I'm not, I have to think about it a little more, but I'm not sure where I'm at on that idea. Um, I do think it is important to know if people are, or hospitals are thinking they want to add or drop services. I don't know if it makes sense to do some sort of threshold or uh, monetary threshold or something like that, just so that it's not, uh, maybe that's not an issue, I don't know. That's what I had. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Tom Pello. <clears throat> um, one question I had for Patrick. Uh, well, first, let me say, um, Patrick, I think you and your team have done a great job here under incredible stress. I mean, this is this is a lot of money, a lot of moving parts, and uh, you know, I think you've been uh, appropriately sensitive to the burdens on. Uh, on hospital staff and have, uh, you know, um, par parsed this down to something that is, 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 is reasonably manageable. So good job on that. My one question, I have a couple of questions. One is on, um, are, are, are there, have you had any discussions at all with the folks that, uh, I'm, are you, am I breaking up? Someone's. Uh, I think you're okay. Go ahead, Tom. Have you had any discussions with the folks at Diva? I know that making any assumptions is is not that reasonable in the current environment, but kind of thinking about Medicaid revenues over the 2021 period, um, I'm sure Diva is seeing uh, changes in enrollment um, and uh, obviously changes in available of state funds. Um, certainly all of that isn't resolved, but um, it, it might be helpful if at least there was some common assumption um, across the hospital population in Diva of, of what that might look like. Um, on the commercial side, we are already in the rate review process and we'll have uh, certainly nowhere near perfect knowledge, but some knowledge as to uh, what, what uh, those numbers are looking like. And so I'm just trying to kind of seeing if whether or not a corral could be uh, built for a fairly large corral, but a corral nonetheless uh, around the Medicaid number that, so we don't get 14 different assumptions from hospitals about what's gonna be happening with Medicaid. Okay, noted. Okay, the, the other is, um, 
on the on the three and a half percent cap, I'm I uh, my feeling is that I would be okay with a cap with a very small C. Um, that three and a half percent has a history um, based in the growth of the state state economy, um, and uh, it includes a period of great recession. Um, and certainly not at the level of this current problem, but of, but um, the 2008-2009 recession is buried in that number. Um, and so if it were a small C, um, because it's still kind of a North Star for a lot of what we do, um, I'd kind of like to keep it visible. But again, um, you know, not in a, uh, um, you know, tough regulatory kind of sort of way. Um, <clears throat> The other um, thing for me, I think, and this might fall into this discussion on, on charges, um, I, I think... You know, just to interrupt you for a second, could I ask everyone to put themselves on mute unless they are speaking? Because we seem to have some interference coming in from Tom. So if everybody could be on mute, and Tom, go ahead. Okay. Um, the... Uh, I mean, a focus for me is going to be survivability. Um, I I want um, all of our hospitals to um, to to survive this and uh, land on a solid footing um, as as we exit the COVID period. And I note that uh, one of the numbers that sticks with me is I'm looking at the numbers that Patrick issued for the 2015 to 2019 period. And um, over that, that five-year period, there was $329 million total operating margin across all 14 hospitals, but 90% of it went to one hospital. And, um, and we have other hospitals that are, are, are in negative operating territory, not just a few, but, but more than half our population. So for me, trying to get uh, the arms around of what are the resources that we can reasonably look toward in 2021. And again, there's going to be a wide margin of error around that, but how do we allocate those so that all hospitals come out of the 2021 20, 20, period, um, at least uh, standing on their feet? So those are uh, my observations at this point. Thank you, Tom. Uh, next, we're going to go to Maureen. Maureen Usper. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm back back on the internet here. Um, <laughs> first, I really want to thank uh, the hospital budget team for all the work that they've put behind this. Um, and you know, I think it really was a thorough process, and they did include you know several of the CFOs. Um, from the hospitals to get their feedback on the timing and the submissions. And if anything, the, the um, CFOs um, added things to this um, deck. So I, I was really um, happy for that participation. Um, and I helped with this too. And, and one thing I think I, I overlooked and I, I would like to talk about maybe adding back in, I don't think it's gonna be huge. And I think most of the hospitals would do it anyway, but the risk and opportunities um, piece, I think um, you know that will probably be brought out, obviously, with the whole COVID piece. But I think just making sure we still incorporate whatever risk and opportunities, because what I do see for this whole process this time is that it really is going to be much more of discussions with the hospitals. We're going to have you know less information that they're going to be providing, and so we really want to understand you know for each hospital what's going on and what the impacts of everything that's been happening will be. And so I think um, I would like to throw that out to the group for discussion about, you know, re-including the, the risk and opportunities piece. And, it, and I'd also say, you know, for the, um, I know mo most of the work in, on some of these slides are done by the CFOs. And if they still want to provide any of the bridges or anything like that, um, when they submit, they, they can, or when they do their presentations, we're just trying to make it much streamlined for them. But, you know, to, what, to whatever extent they, they want to include some of that, that's fine. Um, when we talk about um, the, uh, I guess first I'll say with the timing, 
you know, yeah, I, I understand that the later we wait, the more information that, that everyone will have. But what we tried to do was move it out a month, um, get keep the presentations in August and really have that again be a, a lot more of discussion between the board and the hospitals. And knowing that in order to have rate discussions with the insurance companies, that typically needs to be done with a 60 day plus window, you know, they're going to need to understand that, you know, by within October. So, so I think, uh, you know, I've always said budgets are obsolete from day one, and, and this certainly will be, but, you know, we'll just have to keep apprised of what's going on. When we talk about the 3.5% um, cap, I've also been one to say I don't think one size fits all, and, you um, you know, I think particularly this year with so much going on and the impact of COVID is different on each of the hospitals, that that's even more um, more the case. Um, I think I can kind of combine between enforcement and, and, a, and whether we do a no cap or a, a modified cap. You know, I, I do see, and I'll, I'll try to give a simple example, um, if a hospital was a $100 million target for this year and half their year went, went along okay, you know, September, October through March, knowing March we did have some impact, and the rest of the year they were impacted and were down possibly 50%, that hospital could be showing $75 million for this year. Um, Next year, if we assumed the base would have been 100, and, and I know that assumption is very difficult because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID, but if we assumed a normal year, they would have been around that 100, 103, but now they need to, the three was the 3% increase, now they need to get back the, some of this lost um, electives that didn't happen, you know, they could have been as high as 125. Um, we know we're going to lose some of this elective surgeries and things may not come back, but it's significantly higher than the 3.5% cap would be the, that example. Um, so I, I think to try to, to say you're going to be at 3.5% um, is a challenge. And so I, I agree with being much more flexible there, whether we do it as a no NPR cap or in that example, I would give it's almost like a combined of what did you miss in in 2020. The max you could be would be adding that back to 21. And we're hearing that probably would still be excessive because people probably aren't going to be coming back into the hospital and some of these electives will be lost forever. So, you know, so, something along that line might be something we could talk about. Um, when we do talk about enforcement, I do want to be careful about, I, I guess, you know, we want to talk about what, when is the, when do we have to make that decision on what we'll do with enforcement, and just being careful about agreeing on something now when we don't know a lot of what might happen. And if I, the example there would be, um, if if there are very high um, insurance rates that go into the submissions and, and, and are approved, and then we actually don't have a huge impact with COVID, the electives do come back, and we settle out all the money that they were receiving federally, and it's more than we thought. Now, I'm being very optimistic there. I, I understand that. But at the end of the day, then if hospitals were actually able to to turn around and do better than expected on, on a bottom line as well as a top line, you know, I would want to make sure we still have some leeway there. And that is probably not, unfortunately, going to be the case that that happens. But there's just so much unknown about what is going to happen in the future. Um, and when we talk about the guidance on rates, uh, that, that's interesting, and uh, I'm not really sure where I stand on that as far as giving explicit guidance, um, because I think each hospital is going to be different. So I, I guess I'd like to discuss that a little bit more 
with the board about and, and hear a little bit more about Robin's idea about that, um, only because I don't know where we would start. So is that going to be 10%? Is it going to be 5%? Is it 15%? Is it a set number? Is it a mix? So I, I think um, I think that's a tough one to just be able to throw out now um, what, what we would give on rates. Um, and then just, you know, really kind of saying that I really do believe that you know, it is going to be much more of hospital specific reviews about how each hospital has been impacted um, differently by COVID and what that was going to mean across all of these areas, what NPR would be, what what rate increases would be, um, and, you know, having much more of discussions when the hospitals come in. And, and as Patrick brought out, maybe maybe next year it's going to be more frequently that we're able to meet with the hospitals because things may change. Are there going to be mid-year adjustments and things like that? So, um, but I I do just want to reinforce that you know I think it is important to continue with this process and and knowing that there is so much uncertainty, but the hospitals are all still, they still need to be planning for what they believe is going to happen next year for utilization, for their staffing, for everything else. And so, you know, they, they're going to be producing budgets um, for their banks and other things like that. So I, I think this fits in with that process. And that's all I have. Kevin, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear yes. me? Thank you. Yes, we can. <laughs> so the, the good news is I think what I'm hearing from uh, my colleagues on the board is um, the primary goal is the, the fiscal sustainability of our healthcare system in the state of Vermont. And um, just to touch back on a few points that people have made, um, uh, I agreed with uh, Tom that I think that there does need to be a number um, for NPR for the budget. But again, that would depend if, if people are going to enforce against that number um, and not take into effect um, this year's drop in volume, then um, I would not be able to support that. So it's, it's all part of how that discussion focuses in. And as we all know, um, it's not just price that determines um, the growth in our healthcare spending in the state, it's utilization as well. And so we really need to be looking at price and utilization. And the, the last thing um, on that issue that I would say is that I would be very worried if we did not have any number, because I think that would be a race for increasing utilization in order to set a new base. And I think that that would concern me if we were to go down that path. Um, Robin, I agree complete with, with you on um, we need to have a discussion about um, changing charges um, because I do think that we're going to have to have a bifurcated change in charge rate. And by that, I mean that there will be one component that relates um, to um, what I would call a permanent change in charge and one component that would be temporary. And the temporary nature of that goes back to the equation of price and utilization because we want to give all our hospitals a chance to get back on proper financial ground. And so um, I think it would be reckless if we just threw out a permanent huge change in charge increase. But if we gave them time. And again, I'm not even sure if, if hospitals will be able to get back on firm financial ground in 21, it may be 22, and it might even be 23, because we just don't know at this point whether or not there will be multiple waves. We don't know if there will be stronger therapeutics. We don't know when a vaccine um, will be developed. So there are so many variables, and we just we can't accurately measure the fear 
that people have in going to medical settings right now. I think we'll have a better handle on that um, by the end of this summer, but it, it won't be a firm handle. We're, we're still going to be um, staring into making um, best projections, and at, at best, that's what we're going to be able to do. So um, that's kind of my thoughts on that, and with that, I'll open it up to the public for public comment. And again, if you're on the phone, please hit star six, and if you're on Skype, please just unmute your mic button. Mr. Chairman, this is Jeff Timas. Okay, Jeff, go ahead. Um, first, I want to thank you and the board um, and your staff who have been so supportive and, and helpful over the past several weeks and, and really acknowledging the, the contributions and challenges that hospitals have faced um, and, and being our partners in this, so I appreciate that. Uh, regarding today's conversation, uh, we certainly appreciate this directional move to a, to a much more streamlined and simplified budget framework. Um, and as the board members, I think, have, have pointed out this afternoon, uh, projections on volume and revenue are, are going to be really difficult and volatile right now for obvious reasons. Um, so clearly with the process that's been kind of laid out here, there are, sp there are specifics still to be worked out. Um, but I appreciate that the board is clearly acknowledging the challenge of budgeting and forecasting right now um, and, and recognizing that, that hospitals, through no fault of their own, just may not be able to make those predictions with any real degree of accuracy. Um, so I, I, I think I hear this, but I hope the board will continue to be open to working with individual hospitals that, for various reasons, may need deadline extensions or other accommodations to manage um, within the timeline that, that would, within whatever timeline is adopted. Um, and, and on the timing issue, um, I agree with um, board member Holmes that waiting longer could potentially provide more data to the board to consider um, and want to point out um, that Act 91 actually releases the board from meeting the October deadline. Um, so with that, I'll thank you again for the opportunity to comment um, and um, thanks. Thank you, Jeff. We look forward to working with you and each of the uh, hospitals as we uh, move forward through this. And really, it's going to be a collaborative approach to put our healthcare system back on firm footing. So thank you. Uh, other members Everything. of the public? Question? Go ahead. So I'm going to use more of a consumer approach in listening to all of this. And, and Kevin, the way you summed it up, I think is excellent for what the consumer is really going to be looking at. And I've been listening to the legislative testimony and this does trend out to 2023, even if there was some startling new, um, something comes out of medicine that there's a vaccine actually by this fall, whatever. That's not going to stop the econ economic effects. It's not, there's something in here that will trend out to 2023. Either it's increase in property taxes, schools trying to get themselves back together, and healthcare is going to show up everywhere. It's going to show up in the schools, it's going to show up in many different places. But here's my point that's public health. We're talking about public health is really the crisis right now. Hospitals are in crisis, but it's the public health ability to get on top of the pandemic that is the crisis. In that crisis, you have a crisis for the schools, a crisis for the economy in general, um, you, you may even have, if you don't have a second wave of COVID, due to the fear factor, you may have an un, unexpected wave of flu next winter because people wouldn't go get their flu shots. You might even get a measles outbreak because people wouldn't take their kids in for an M MMR shot. There are many things that we are, it's, tough to wrap your mind around 
what could happen going forward. So on things like the charge, could you do something like if you increase it, Robin mentioned temporary, well, could you call it a COVID charge where it's parsed out as separate and as the pandemic and its effects mitigate, that separate charge goes away. And that's assuming that some of the revenues will come back. And it's also true that there is some electives that that revenue will never come back. But it's also true that there are things called electives that over time it moves from elective to it no longer is an elective and it needs to be done. And I was just reading an article the other day, how much of this so-called elective is going to come back as emergencies or, or things like that. I'm also therefore concerned about in general, as we work through this to keep the hospitals afloat, you got to keep the consumer afloat or the consumer can't come back to the hospital. Um, it's really complicated. And I will just note that what the state is looking at is a skinny budget. I heard it called that today. It's a three month budget because a natural cash you're working with, you aren't going to look at three years that you don't have a projection for three years of revenue. It's much smaller. But in terms of understanding something that makes any sense, I think it is, it's a two-year look or a three-year look in terms of the length of time of the pandemic and the associated many waves of other effects has to be considered. Hope that wasn't too jumbled and complicated to try to say, but um, those are my thoughts. Thank you. No, they were great thoughts, Dale, and you really uh, summarized the uh, the bigger picture, and that's really what we were talking about with a bifurcated rate is to have a portion. You could call it a COVID-related portion of a change in charge. You could call it a, a recognition for a drop in utilization rate that's temporary. You could call it a number of different things. You could call it um, uh, a return to sustainability portion of the charge, but recognizing that it's temporary and uh, um, that would be one component of the rate. So I think uh, um, what you've brought out is uh, so true. And I would say that um, each and every hospital in their own way has gone to a skinny budget, um, at least for the remainder of this year. And you can see that hospitals have done a number of things, including um, taking pay reductions and furloughs and everything else to try to um, mitigate some of the uh, severe revenue shortfalls that they've had. And so um, I think that all um, is going to factor into um, the rest of the 2020 budget year, which will end on 930 and will carry over into 21, depending on how the experience continues as we go through the summer and into the fall. So um, great points, thank you, Dale. Other members of the public? And again, star six if you're on the phone or, or uh, unmute your microphone if you're on Skype. Hi, Chair, this is Mark Stanislaus with a question or you know, just a couple thoughts. I was getting worried, Mark, that we weren't going to hear from a CFO, so thank you. <laughs> okay. So, I, I mean, first of all, too, well, like everyone else, I would like to extend, um, you know, a gratitude of thanks to the Green Mountain Care Board um, um, and the staff. I mean, because they certainly listened, and, you know, I don't know how you can peel back the data request any further well, than, you know, than what, what has been offered. And, we, you know, still go through a budget process. So we thank you very much. There are a couple things. I mean, I think I think we're trying to walk the line between enforcement and, you know, revenue cap. And, you know, in my mind, 
I think it's difficult to do both right now. I mean, where you either need to fall down on one side of the line or the other as it comes well to rates. But I would just kind of like to share something, you know, with you. And 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 so I I mean, I think for the most part, and and this probably varies a little bit by each hospital, but hospitals for a two month period have lost 50% of their revenues. Okay, and. If you just do the pure math, you know, that's 8% of their total revenue. Um, and, 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 that assumings, and that assumes the population is going to come back um, and, you know, start to utilize the services at the same rate by year end. And so, you know, I'm just speaking openly that, I, I mean, I think hospitals um, are going to end the year eight to say 15% of their revenue down, maybe more. And, and, and a significant of that portion, even if people don't come back to the same utilization, is going to carry over to FY21. So, you know, if you just do simple math and say, um, you know, let's just say that it's eight to 16%, you know, let's just say half of that carries over. And if, and, and then, you know, if on top of that the normalized well, you know trend was three and a half percent, you're looking at an eleven to twelve percent increase in NPR from a budget perspective in FY21. So you know I think it's going to be difficult to. I mean I mean I just don't know. I mean well for somebody that usually has a good idea on how to come up with something. I just don't know how you combat that into a meaningful number. So, you know, the change is going to be significant uh, um, because a lot of that volume is going to carry over to next year. It's, um, I think maybe it's understanding how much of, of that is in the budget for next year. I mean, I think our focus as far as the end game needs to be more what is our approach going to be in FY22. and. How can we build flexibility, we you know, for that? But I really think in FY21, you know, um, I mean, all bets are off for many, many different, you know, reasons, you know, reasons. And this is about engaging in more of a conversation throughout the continuum of the year more than anything else. And, and, and then the other thought I would throw out there, or, or you know, there's two other thoughts that I would throw out there. I mean, well, the first one is, you know, we don't know what kind of payer mix, we know, shift there is going to be. You know, so most of these budgets are probably going to be on what the payer mix, you know, was or used to be or, or you know, mostly, you know, used to be. So, so, you know, there's a huge unknown in that category also. So, you know, this is why I would kind of say, you know, the continuum of this conversation is going to be more important than what we decide in the budget process. So I just kind of throw that thought out there. Um, um, I mean, the continuum of the conversation is going to be very, very important. And, and then the other thought that I would throw out there, while this is possible and it has been done before, it is very complicated and it's very confusing to, to calculate the exact impact of doing a mid-year rate change. So, you know, whatever we think about of, of we know if there's a portion of the relate of the rate, we know, related with COVID or not, I would say the best thing is to, to do is to revisit that in next year cycle because it's complicated on, on doing a mid-year adjustment. So, you know, those are the thoughts that I have to share, and we know um, I thank you for this opportunity, we know, to share the thoughts. Good luck. Thank you very much, Mark. Other members of the public? Hearing none, um, we'll come back to this issue at next week's board meeting. I, I think each of the board members has a lot to uh, think about over the uh, next week, and we'll have to debate through the different topics that have been brought up 
and try to come to a conclusion. Um, so with that, I am going to- Kevin, say, could I ask a process question before you- Certainly, go on? ahead, Robin. Um, so um, I'm wondering if it would make sense um, to try, and I, this does not have to be me, but to have staff work with somebody on what a, sort of a little more fleshed out charge guidance would look like. And to Maureen's earlier point, I, I wasn't myself thinking that it would be a target number. It would be more qualitative in terms of potential considerations or like your idea of the bifurcated, just so that um, we could get a document out for people to look at, because I think if we talk about it next week, then we'd have to rewrite and then vote. So I just didn't know process-wise if you yeah, were worried I, I don't about... even know if we will get to a vote next week, Robin, but okay. um, I had planned on asking uh, Patrick's team to create some guidance on charge and with some different options and to post that so that we could get public comment. Um, the the reality is there are a number of issues, and I'm just not sure all the issues will be resolved by next Wednesday, but if we could begin to go through those, um, it may require that we throw um, a board meeting on a different date other than a Wednesday in addition so that uh, we get through these all in a timely enough manner so that hospitals can do this um, by the end of July. So um, if, is that okay with you, Robin? That sounds great. I just wasn't sure uh, what you were thinking and thought it might be helpful just to understand kind of the plan. Thank you. Okay. So Patrick, consider that request in. <laughs> Done. Okay. So with that, I'm going to um, transfer over to Christina McLaughlin, who is going to um, lead us on a discussion of a request that we had to consider um, forming a um, temporary, uh, a technical advisory group concerning prescription drugs. So Christina, whenever you, you can uh, take the screen. Thank you. And I will start sharing my screen now. These um, slides, this is Susan, these slides are also on our website. So for those who do not have access to the screen. Thank you, Susan. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I'm here to just um, briefly kind of give some background and go over the language um, that we proposed back in March to the legislature for a prescription drug technical advisory group. Um, and after I speak, I will pass the baton to Jeff Hochberg, president of the Vermont Regional Drug so with that, um, like I said, the board had proposed um, the language for the prescription drug technical advisory group to the House Healthcare Committee on March 12, 2020. Uh, the Healthcare Committee had asked the board to um, put together some language for prescription drug transparency. Um, and we had, we meaning me and Jeff Hochberg, uh, testified on March 12th um, with the proposed language and answered some of the committee's questions that day. Um, and if most of you should, will know that and remember well that Friday the 13th, it seemed like our world was turned upside down. Uh, that is when the Vermont legislature and um, everyone else was shiftly or quickly shifting their focus, sorry, to um, COVID-19 related issues. So. Uh, we had proposed this language, and the next day um, it was very apparent that perhaps this language wouldn't be able to make it very far just because, of course, in light of the pandemic, um, there are very um, much more pressing issues that the legislature and other entities uh, needed to take on right away. Um, so really, given the fact, we fast forward to now, um, given the fact that the board has this authority already, to establish additional uh, advisory groups as needed um, to carry out its duties um, under statute. Uh, the board um, felt like they could discuss establishing this group at today's public meeting. Um, and so with that, I wanna just go over the proposed language. Um, this, um, and I'll just read it through very briefly. So 
we propose that the Green Mountain Care Board shall establish a prescription drug technical advisory group pursuant to 18 VSA section 9374E2 to provide input and recommendations on the topics described in subsection B to the board through January 15th, 2020. The board shall appoint interested stakeholders with applicable subject matter expertise as appropriate. The prescription drug techni technical advisory group may provide recommendations to the board on one or more of the following topics. Number one, models that enhance the board's ability to analyze, monitor, or report the pricing of prescription drug products or the relationship between prescription drug pricing and consumer prescription drug costs. Two, the effectiveness of prescription drug initiatives on prescription drug costs. Or three, other mechanisms for increasing prescription drug price transparency at one or more levels of the prescription drug supply chain. And finally, we propose that the board shall provide a report to the General Assembly on or before January 15th, 2022, based on recommendations from the Prescription Drug Technical Advisory Group. Um, and thinking back to when we proposed this language um, in March, we created this timeline of a couple years just so that we wouldn't have to uh, request additional funding. Um, we felt um, at the time, and things may have changed since, that we could do this work in-house as is um, without requesting more money. Um, so that is why we had that longer timeline um, as part of the language. So again, I wanted to keep this brief. Um, if there's no questions from the board, I'd like to pass it over to Jeff Hochberg um, to share a couple um, slides. Uh, thanks, Christina. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, for the record, my name is Jeff Hochberg, president of the Vermont Retail Druggist. Um, to echo some of the comments that Christina made, um, the need to better understand and account for the financial role that pharmaceuticals play in the overall healthcare cost has never been more important, uh, nor unanimously agreed upon. Uh, Built into that is a need to better understand the individual inflationary points along the entire spectrum of the pharmaceutical uh, distribution chain. You know, starting from the manufacturer, working all your way down to the consumer level. Stepping back a bit, the greater goal is to investigate ways that we could potentially better manage and hopefully reform the pharmaceutical delivery model so that we can control healthcare costs, uh, and improve access to all Vermonters. That's something that was readily clear for some time. Um, even then Senator Mullen actively pursued with some legislation. Uh, but before we can even begin to contemplate any reformatory program, uh, we need to identify variables and the mechanics involved. Uh, I'd like to just take, for example, the importation model that was pushed um, and now we're certainly not going to see that come to any fruition anytime soon. Um, we need to know all the, the, the inner workings. Um, we need to fully digest all the data that we currently have. And we need to look for ways that we can supplement that data uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, we can't rely upon broad statements that prescription drug prices are going up. So public rates must therefore go up in, in concert. Um, and what we really want to try to do is gain, gain that understanding so that the state can truly act as a health hub, so that Vermont's in a position to understand um, all the different programs that are out there, whether they're importation, 340B, we're talking single payer, formulary changes, um, anything. We know exactly what price points are going to change and how it's going to impact overall healthcare costs. Um, so that's that's where we are. Um, I think um, you know the data that we do have. We need to, you know, it can be. There's enough there that we can begin the process. We can uh, analyze it to provide uh, missing information. Um, from what the uh, insurers and the PVMs are reporting to the VCURES data set. Uh, we could have the ability to incorporate more prescription information into EMR records, um, which enhances the decision-making abilities of providers. Um, understanding and utilizing the data better can uh, expand the functionality of the VPMS monitoring system. 
Um, you can begin to evaluate 340B revenue to hospitals and how that impacts their budgets. Um, you can better evaluate drug formularies across payers. Uh, that's something that's actually going to be crucial in the coming period of time here uh, as we move through this uh, pandemic. Um, I, I promise that within three months, we're going to be seeing much more drug shortages along the supply chains uh, as the global markets continually uh, move. Um, the data, there's a lot of power in data. So we want to understand that data so that we can turn around and better negotiate with drug manufacturers for better rebates um, and, you know, potentially even create a continual revenue stream for the state itself. That data holds value monetarily. So um, there's a lot there. Um, and I really don't want to take up too much time, but, but really just focusing on that we need to understand all the different mechanics and the financial impacts of, of each step within the distribution chain. And that's what we were seeking with the legislation that we proposed earlier this spring. So with that, I'll turn it over to any questions. So thank you, Jeff and Christina. And I just want to uh, follow up with a couple of points. Um, Christina had said that um, we approached the uh, legislature. They actually asked us for a proposal in language. And um, the reason why this is on the um, agenda this afternoon to my fellow board members is I wanted to have a discussion with you um, about your thoughts on this technical advisory group. And just to say that um, it's something that I'm very, very interested in doing, but um, I would not uh, seek to have it as a vote. I'd rather have it just done um, by a decision by myself at some point. And the reason why I say that is we have three open positions. Um, we are currently um, uh, working to try to hire for one of those positions, but we have not been given the green light yet. Um, we recently received additional budget guidance that um, questions some of the uh, general fund dollars that uh, we will have to deal with as an organization. And I don't want to place us in the position where we promise too much and deliver too little, I'd much rather be in the position that we don't overpromise, but we over deliver. And I would say that this is an area um, that was just reinforced by the filings that we received on Friday for the QHP filings. When you take a look at um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield filing, again, like last year, uh, Prescription drugs and especially specialty drugs um, are a major driving component where it's a 3.7% um, uh, increase just due to prescription drugs in that filing. And so the state of Vermont has to try to do whatever it can to create better transparency. And one of the ways that um, pharma has been so successful is to create a system where it's next to impossible for states to figure out um, what the true net cost of a drug is after rebates and marketing allowances and such. And so the thought here would be to try to get some of the best minds in the state together on a, a technical advisory group, similar to the primary care advisory group, and um, try to start brainstorming on what would be possible to see, you know, so often people say, well, states don't have any ability to do anything on this, this area that it's a national problem. It is a national problem. And yes, it would be a lot easier if it was dealt with on a national basis, but we've heard false promises on a national basis for the last two decades. And so it crosses over, um, different uh, political parties and everything else. And this issue continues to um, be a stressing driver to our healthcare system. So with that, I'll open it up to other board members for either questions for Christina or Jeff or your thoughts. And again, if we can go in that same uh, alphabetical order, starting with Dr. Holmes. 
Hi. Okay. Well, thank you. I uh, I don't have any specific questions. I would support the initiative given, you know, however our resource constraints allow, but I certainly think, you know, in all my time at the board, prescription drug prices have been one of the biggest cost drivers, and to the extent that we can find, you know, other ways to reduce those costs, and I agree with Jeff's point, more data, the better we can do that. So generally just supportive and leave it up to you to take it from there. Thank you, Jess. Um, Member Lund. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I think um, a tag on prescription drugs would be interesting and worthwhile. Um, I would say to your point, Kevin, about not over-promising, I feel like even though it was language that we proposed that some of that language is ambitious and difficult to do without either the data, our data team re jiggering their analytics, like they have a plan of their work for the next two years. Um, I think you'd have to reallocate that work potentially or have a contractor because I think otherwise some of the data analytics is going to be tough, particularly when I, I think the challenge, the first challenge of the tag will be trying to figure out some of the confidentiality issues because um, I don't know that you could have your tag members necessarily doing the data analytics if they are also in a proprietary relationship. So that's just all to say, I think there are some challenges, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't move forward and sort out what those challenges are and what's reasonable to do. Thank you, Robin. Member Pelham. Um, I, you know, this is an area that I don't have, you know, any great familiarity with, but it seems on the time I've been on the board that a lot of people have poked their finger at this issue. And, um, you have, you know, the, uh, I've seen the work that Christina has done on this before, um, the information with the, uh, and, and kind of enforcement reporting requirements of the attorney general, um, and the different legislative studies and talks about, you know, buying drugs from Canada, et cetera, et cetera. But it always seems to kind of hit a roadblock somewhere. So um, I would be, I would support this, especially if the focus was to find the strategic points of leverage where we can actually do something. That would not be a data, an, an, you know, analysis. We've had people come in and present Blue Cross Blue Shield, I think, about, uh, you know, the uh, pharmacy benefit management system, et cetera, et cetera. So we know all that stuff. Um, it's just where are the specific points of leverage that we can actually do something to um, to have an effect uh, that, that, that benefits the cost structure here in Vermont? Good points, Tom. Member Usifer? Um, yeah, I don't have any um, questions. I'm supportive of it, and um, I guess one thing would be interested in to understand who would be on the the task force um, because there's uh, could be interesting to see who, to see the different members of who the task force might be. But I am supportive of doing this. I think the pharmaceutical increases have been a key driver in insurance rates and. Um, you know, cost to consumers. So I think it's definitely worthwhile to do. So to answer your question, Maureen, if we were to go down this path, I think we would probably um, throw it open similar to what we've done on the general advisory board. And that is to invite um, people with expertise in the field to um, seek out membership. And, and uh, depending on the numbers, that would be interested in helping the state of Vermont try to get to the bottom line. Um, we might have to um, winnow that uh, list down significantly. And on the flip side, if we don't get um, many people stepping forward, we may have to go out and, and really try to target some key people that would have expertise and try to get them to uh, be willing to uh, serve on that. Okay, thanks. So with that, I'll open it up to members of the uh, public for any public comment. And again, um, star six, if you are on the phone, 
And if you are on Skype, just hit the uh, mute bar on your microphone button. Hi, this is Mort Wasserman. Quick question, the DIVA already has something called the Drug Utilization Review Board. And I wondered how the, this proposed group, or whether or how this proposed group would interact with that group. Well, I think uh, one of the big things that we would be looking is to try to get participation from DIVA. Um, I know that um, Nancy Hogue was on the phone earlier, and I hate to put her on the spot, but if you're still on the phone, Nancy, um, what are your thoughts? Are well, you maybe able we... to hear me? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to figure out the star six thing. Um, so, yes, I, I think I would answer that question by saying that the DIVA DUR board is similar to or analogous perhaps to the commercial payers P&T committees. So every insurer or PBM that supports an insurer, uh, like Express Scripts, for example, and CVS Health, they have their own P&T committees. And, and so we have our DUR board that advises us on drug coverage uh, decisions, whether that's um, you know, that's in consideration of both clinical and cost information. Uh, so looking for clinical appropriateness and safety and efficacy, as well as what is the lowest net cost to the state. And that's what those other P&T committees do as well. So I don't really see them overlapping uh, in, in role or, or scope particularly. I think that the board would continue to function as it has. But of course, um, I would hope to see DIVA representation on any tag that might be formed because I think we could certainly bring forward um, insight and data, so. Yeah, we would definitely uh, look for your participation. Oh, that'd be awesome. Okay, other members of the public? This is uh, Kathy Mahoney, Kevin. Um, I, I have uh, um, a lot of uh, experience in the past of working on similar issues like this with uh, our uh, pharmacy and therapeutics committee. And I think that these are all great points to take a look at. I think it's wonderful. Um, I think that there's probably an enormous ROI on this compared to all of the different committees and projects that could be looked at as you you know, as everybody knows, the rise in uh, prices for pharmaceuticals, both to the insurers and to Vermonters and other citizens, is is tremendous and and really is truly unsustainable. Um, I think that this ties in also to some of the things that we talked about in the in the from the first presentation, with regards to um, variation and uh, and prescription practices and utilization. So I, I think there's a great opportunity with this. Um, and I'm, I was wondering the, the same thing as to how uh, this proposal would tie into other committees in the state that, that look at drug utilization. Uh, and so I thank the, the last person who spoke uh, for that information, but I, I think this is a great idea. Thank you, Kathy. Other members of the public? Jeff, do you want to make any pitch why we should do this in tough uh, uh, budgetary times? Um, I think I'll, I'll end it with what you think you know about prescription drug prices doesn't even touch the surface as to what actually goes on. So uh, the ROI is huge on this. Um, I can't even tell you all the things that I – that I know, um, so it's it's extremely important that we go down this road um, to the best of our abilities. Absolutely. Uh, I w this is Kathy again. I would echo that, and um, I'm happy to take further discussion. Um, you know, beyond this call, if if folks would like. Okay, great. Thank you, Kathy. 
Jeff, uh, a non-question related to um, the technical advisory group, but um, as a representative of the um, Druggist Association, what are your members seeing as far as um, um, store volumes and um, have you held up okay? Um, yes, thanks. Um, it's It's been interesting. Uh, there was a huge surge. Uh, the last half of March was probably the biggest two-week cycle uh, in the history of, of dispensing, and um, it tapered off, uh, as you would have expected. Um, it did put a big strain on the system. Uh, right out of the gates, there was drug supply issues. Um, because of nationwide, everyone was seeking large-day supply quantities, um, and it was just massive. And the logistics behind the distribution channels uh, could not keep pace by any means. Um, we are still on a very strict, what they call fair share allocation. Um, so every pharmacy is only allowed to receive product that um, in the amounts that is uh, reflective of their historical purchasing. Um, credit limits were pushed. Um, so. There's a lot happening there. At the same time, have now, any Vermonters been denied scripts, Jeff, because of that? Um, I think there there have been some for sure. I mean, there's certainly availability issues across the board. Uh, a lot of the pharmacies um, did the right steps and controlled how much people were getting. Um, like we in our stores would actually uh, limit patients uh, in certain cases, certainly on like inhalers. Um, uh, as to how many you could get at a time so that the general public as a whole could receive as much as, as available. Um, uh, thanks to people like Nancy Hogue at, at Diva, um, they made very quick decisions to uh, adapt formularies to cover uh, a broad spectrum of therapeutically equivalent products uh, like inhalers. Uh, they had a preferred agent. That agent was very difficult to get, so they opened it up to the entire breadth of, of albuterol inhalers. Um, other reforms are continually to happen. Um, DFR has been holding weekly calls that we've been a participant of um, and trying to just continue that whole thought process because uh, in the months to come, it's going to become difficult. Um, the uh, drug shortages are going to increase, uh, and it's not drugs that are necessarily related to COVID-19. This is your entire spectrum of, of drug catalogs. Um, Manu what I've learned is that manufacturers typically house about six to nine months worth of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Um, and that's enough to create about, uh, you know, a, we, we've got, already got about a year uh, supply, so we're good for a year and a half on, on the active pharmaceutical ingredient. But um, what we don't carry in, uh, in their warehouses, they don't carry the uh, stabilizers, the excipients. Um, these, those inner tablets that make a tablet a tablet. And most of that comes from overseas. So with the global disruption, um, that's going to quickly dry up. So blood pressure medications are going to become difficult to get. Uh, there's a lot that could happen. And hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully things are opening back up. But uh, it's a concern. The FDA actually had a call recently um, about that very issue. So uh, I'll keep you posted. Great. We appreciate that. Any any updates you can give us uh, would be very helpful. And uh, also, like you, I want to uh, say that, um, you know, I served 20 years in the legislature and and uh, uh, came to see the work of Nancy Hogue over those years. And she's an incredible public servant. And so it doesn't surprise me to hear from you that she acted quickly and uh, did the right thing. So. Yeah, she's she's been great. She's a great leader to us, uh, and uh, you know I think her efforts in Diva um, actually position the state really well with what we want to do here. Our, our the bigger goals, the loftier goals of controlling prescription drug prices. Vermont is uniquely situated to have real impact on the industry, uh, at least starting with Vermont, and we can show we can lead by example, and others can pick up on it. And, and a lot of thanks to her and her team. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thank, thank you, you Christina.
Um, I just want to um, open it up now for any old business to come before the board. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. I see the sun is shining, but I'm not sure if the temperatures are that warm. Bye-bye. <laughs>